Live. All right, we want to welcome you guys out to uh, the latest edition of uh, Talk on Things on Stuff. Um, as you know, that this is kind of a periodic uh, video podcast where we get uh, various different people that um, have an interest in uh, Mormon history to talk about different things that go on. And the most recent thing is actually pretty exciting for people who have been paying attention to Mormon history, and that is the publication of the minutes for the Council of Fifty. Um, <clears throat> We're going to hopefully start to see a lot more about this. This is uh, documents about one of the last secret organizations that Joseph Smith formed shortly before he was murdered. And uh, the minutes have actually been closed to research for over a century. And with the Joseph Smith Papers Project, uh, they're now going to be available for uh, scholars and researchers and bloggers and everyone to take a look at um, freely. So we've got an eclectic group of people here um, to talk about it. Uh, first, uh, we'll start out by introducing um, Mithrin. How are you Howdy. doing today, Mithrin? Welcome. Doing All pretty right. well. So I've got the uh, the website uh, Exploring Mormonism, and I've been on a few podcasts, and, and this is pretty cool to be able to be here and talk about. I'm excited. All right. Well, we're glad to have you. And then uh, next we have uh, No Cool Name Tom. Hi. Tom Doggett. I've uh, been on the Blogger Hackle and and Mormon history for a while, although most recently I'm most famous because I run a YouTube channel with a ton of Mormon videos. So. All right, and that's actually a really rich resource. If you're, uh, we can put a link in the the description here, but it's basically an archive of every old LDS video, training video, commercial that that you could imagine, and it's a lot of fun to go through that. Okay, so the format. Too. Say again. I'm just always oh, trying to find more too. So. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, so the format that we have today is um, there was recently the 2016 Fair Mormon Conference where one of the editors behind the upcoming volume of the uh, Minutes of the Council of Fifty and uh, participant in the uh, Joseph Smith Papers Project uh, gave kind of a little preview into the contents and the history of the Minutes of the Council of Fifty and I think gave us all a preview about how they're going to address some of the difficult issues that maybe were the reason why these have never been made public before. Now uh, before we start, what do you guys know, just gestalt, you guys have been reading about this stuff for a long time, what are the like the juicy things that we expect to find in the Minutes of the Council of Fifty? Monarchy! Monarchy? That's probably. I, I think that's probably the the big detail that I think a lot of people will come away from when they first look at it, uh, is uh, that uh, the Council of Fifty, being uh, the earthly kingdom of God before the the coming of Jesus Christ, and uh, setting up Joseph Smith as uh, prophet, uh, the prophet Syrian king, prophet or, priest uh, and prophet, king, the threefold title, king, yeah, PPK. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, which, which fact, like, like polygamy, uh, leaked out into the surrounding countryside and uh, was also kind of a role with uh, the, the martyrdom, the, the assassination. Yeah. And if, if you guys are familiar with the Nauvoo Expositors, it's that, one, that was one of the things that they cited, is that uh, they were not going to respect anyone but Christ as, as their prophet, priest, and king. And that's a title that's usually reverse, reserved for Christ. Um, right. What about you, Ken? Uh, what are you looking forward to? Uh, so the the big things I'm going to go for are what my seminary teacher taught me about back in the in the day. So he said that it was about getting Joseph Smith elected as president. It was it involved members and non-members, uh, and it was not a big deal. And we shouldn't really look too much into it. Those are the big things that I remember being taught back in uh, in church history. Um, pretty much all the way through BYU Institute. They also kind of covered very briefly that there was such an organization. It had 50 members. It was mainly to get Joseph Smith elected. So let's see if that bears out uh, in, in the actual notes now that they've been released. Um, now, one of the things I think we should say going forward, or just right up front, is that the uh, these notes were moved from the first presidency's vault in 2010 to the church historian's office. That's the first time anyone had a chance to look at them. And in 2013 is when they actually put a team. So this is really cutting edge stuff. So I should, probably shouldn't blame the seminary teachers too much. They didn't have access to this either. Well, that's, that's a fair point. All right, well, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and uh, start 
and we're going to see uh, the beginning of their introduction. Matthew Grohl. Thanks, Mike. I'm flattered that you would choose me over a five-minute break. It's uh -huh. my privilege uh -huh. today to provide a sneak peek uh, into a book that will be released to the public in about five weeks. We actually received the first of the books off the printing press just a few days ago. It's the latest volume in the Joseph Smith Papers, The Minutes of the Council of Fifty in Nauvoo, Illinois. For those not familiar with the council, it met regularly from March 1844 when it was founded by Joseph Smith until January 1846, right before the exodus from Nauvoo. The publication of these minutes is another step in the Joseph Smith papers' ongoing efforts to publish all of his papers. Because the minutes have never been open to research, the Council of 50 has been the subject of tremendous speculation over the years. The views expressed in the Council minutes represent the thinking of church leaders in the mid-1840s, a particularly turbulent time in both Mormon and American Oscar, history. Oscar. They don't represent necessarily what the... So this is interesting this is that we are already peddling a little bit. We're getting some feedback getting there, do you? Feedback there, do you? All right. Not sure what the there. deal is on that. Thank you. Uh, th that uh, this is this is old school thinking. I mean, it's foundational thinking. It's going to define everything we know about the church going forward, and all the branches that come off. But we're going to go ahead and separate before we say anything else about it. Let's put some distance between the modern church and the ancient church because we know those two things are totally different, right? We never claim mm. that it's one consistent church throughout all of history. So we should just immediately. Make sure that everyone's clear on that. Well, and as we know, the Council of 50 is simply a product of its time, like many other right. councils of religious organizations of the day. It's um, I can understand a little bit when they're going to get into, uh, you know, some of the more political actions, but it, it is, contextually speaking, it is a product of the 1840s. But uh, it's a little odd Absolutely. that uh, he's going to bring up uh, that it has a social context. Um, right at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. Just hedging their bets before we even get started. Yeah. Let's get started. All right. Well, let's see what else he has to say. There. Church teaches today about topics such as theocracy. Today, of course, the church makes every effort to be politically neutral, even during the past presidential election featuring of a church member. All right. Let's all pause. All right, let's all pause and just laugh a little bit. Laugh a little bit at that. <laughs> Romney, Romney. So, so uh, there was a there was an article um, published by I think a Utah senator or congressperson where he actually exposed the degree to which the church influences oh, yeah. the Utah oh, legislature, and it I mean to say that the church is not political in the realm of Utah is such a, a blatant misrepresentation of the reality. Um, I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons the Council of 50 kind of went away was because its whole point was to be this, like, bridge between, you know, political and, and government and the church, and they already had that. It was getting rather superfluous as time went on in, in the state of Utah. That'd be, that's just totally me. But that well, be I mean, if argument. you think about it, they they kind of tacitly already had a theocracy within Nauvoo itself. You had Joseph Smith, who was the leader of the military, who was the mayor, who was the supreme justice in the court system. Not only was he that, but then he was also the prophet. He was the, the president of the church. He was the president of the, uh, the quorum of the, um, the um, people who were endowed. And, and now he was the president of, of this organization. He was in charge of the police force. I mean, there was, he had both civil and religious... Um, and, and so I think what's going to be interesting when he goes on to talk later about what the ideals that the Council of 50 were aspiring to, we can already see in practical effect what those ideals will be in the microcosm yeah. of Nauvoo. So when he says we're going to respect everybody's liberty, you're going to say, well, how did that work out for the Nauvoo Expositor? And, no, but, we do need to, to 
to say that he wasn't mayor of Nauvoo until after John C. Bennett was run out. So there was some time when, when Bennett was right, there. Right, but, but that, was in 19, that was in 1842, and the council here was right. started in 1844. It's right, also so this is a post-Bennett concept. Yeah. I do want to... Can we do a comparison with, uh, say, a, a current political figure? Uh, if we were to imagine one of the candidates running, and we can take either or all four, however you want to do that, but just imagine them saying the things and doing the things that Joseph did as we go through this. I think it'll put it in a lot of context. So if we were to picture... Uh, you know, um, this is this is a bad example right off the bat, but we'll start there. Uh, Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump burning a printing press or, say, trying to shut down a bunch of blogs, making commentary about them, supposedly, and I will see how this goes, uh, crowning themselves king or having them vote on to be crowned king within their political... Kenneth, don't get too crazy, because you, you know the, the the explanation there is going to be that you know people had different ideas of liberty. You know, back then, I'm sure they were all okay with burning printing presses and suppressing. <laughs> you know, I don't think those are ideals that America were founded on. I mean, I'm pretty sure they, that was like. Anyway, all right, let's keep going because this is a long talk. <clears throat> yeah, I think it would be good to uh, keep that in mind though as we're going. As we're going. No, I agree. I agree. I agree. Tense of these minutes remind us of another era in which the church was decidedly not politically neutral. First, let's give a little history of the minutes themselves. William Clayton, an English convert who began clerical work for Joseph Smith in 1842, was appointed clerk of the council during its first meeting. He kept meeting minutes on loose sheets of paper and later copied these minutes into three small bound volumes. In their deliberation, council members frequently emphasized the importance of confidentiality, including the need to safeguard these minutes. Willard Rich. Okay, I just okay, have to pause, it right, have to pause there. it right there. Yep, yep. <laughs> because, because one of the things one that I've been looking for to, to in these, I don't know why I'm having an echo, but uh, in these minutes is uh, I was doing research for looking at the layers of conflicts of interest in the city council, and it became very clear that um, everybody on the city council, with very few exceptions, was subordinate to Joseph Smith in a secret society that had taken oaths of secrecy that were sealed on penalty of death. And the fact that membership into the Council of Fifty was no different. They took an oath and it was sealed on penalty of death and and the, since nobody had these minutes the only way we knew about that was in the journal of Joseph F. Smith where several decades later they're talking about admitting new people and and they say well we we need to administer the penalty and, and members of the quorum said no we don't there's no penalty and they said well let's go check the minutes and he writes in his uh, journal that they checked the minutes and the penalty was sanctioned. And um, and so this is the first time that we're going to be able to see that. Now, oddly, if you go to the Joseph Smith to the Church History website and look at Joseph Smith's scanned journal, that entry is totally blocked out. They have completely censored it up <laughs> until this time. Exactly. And so this is going to be one of the first times where, you know, okay, so he's going to make the case that you know they they wanted to be secret um, because they were you know they were basically laying the the government foundation for the future or whatever. At what point do you need that degree of secrecy? I mean, what they're talking about is the entire description of, of secret combinations that exist in the Book of Mormon where people take oaths that they'll die if they disclose their activities. That's exactly what the Council of Fifty is. Right, and, and as we go on, he's going to focus heavily on, you know, the Council was involved in Joseph Smith's election, and it was involved in resettlement of the Mormons. And for both of those, it, why, why would you need any sort of secrecy at that point? It, it seems bizarre to be like, well, we're going to have a secret club whose whole job is to decide where we're going to move to. Right. You know? and you're we're going to have a secret club. These, yeah, these, minutes, these minutes are not secret. They're sacred. They were oh. special <laughs> minutes written by a special fountain pen in such special, holy, detailed... Actually, they're going to go on about how this is not at all about the holiness or the church right. in any it's way. Right. Totally it's totally secular. It's, it's Totally secular, but it's sacred, not secret. Just and, and it's also the government that will exist when Christ returns. And so, 
Anyway, all right, let's keep going. Wait, 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 before we keep wait, going, there's one more thing I have to say, if he's just about to say it, and that is that, is that the Council of the 50, the secret name is, starts with WTF. Yeah. Okay. I think that just needs to be said, the secret name WTF, it, it, what it's if? Y. It's YTF. It's 50, 50 backwards. backwards. Right, I, right. I, okay, YTF. Well, it was, well, it was really, really close to what the... Yes, okay. <laughs> The secret by referring to the council as YTFIF in Joseph Smith's journal, a code that perhaps could be broken. You think? You think? <laughs> they almost certainly believe that knowledge of their discussions regarding theocracy in the kingdom of God would increase the already widespread belief that Latter day Saints opposed key elements of American democracy. On the night of June 22nd, 1844, knowing that he would soon be en route to Carthage, Joseph Smith sent for Clayton and ordered him to burn up the records, to burn the records of the kingdom, or put them in some safe hands and send them away, or else bury them up. Clayton went home that night, put the records in a small box, and buried them in his garden. We're grateful he chose that option, not the burning one. You hear the concept, hear the concept of, of if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to be worried about, and 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 as apostates, you know, if you do anything to, you know, maybe protect your family from where you are faithfully, so that you don't have the repercussions. But you're always accused of like being deceptive or being deceitful. And so it strikes me as interesting here that. Um, you don't generally think of honest men saying, quick, burn the records. Right. Let's take it back to the political discussion, like I said. Imagine there was a political candidate who had a whole bunch of secret emails or some sort of transmissions, and they were to, say, be deleted or burned or said to be hidden, and then it came out later. You know, how would Mormons feel about a candidate like that? Would they immediately say we should totally excuse all of it, or would they be immediately suspicious that such secret documents were hidden. I, I think there's a there's an argument to be made that uh, there's there's a little bit of and I'm going to go back and forth on both both parties just so you know throughout. But I think there's a little bit of Hillary Clinton moment here where you don't need to burn it and you don't need to hide it, like you said, if there's nothing wrong. Uh, that's actually a very uh, pertinent uh, parallel. I appreciate you bringing that up. All right, let's keep going. On July 3rd, 1844, shortly after Joseph's death, Clayton unburied the minutes, and he soon began copying these loose sheets of papers into the first of these small volumes. Following the exodus from Nauvoo, the minutes were taken to Utah. They were used in the 1850s uh, when the manuscript history of the church was written, and some of them were used uh, in publications such as the Deseret News. But even so, the original, the original minutes continued to be closely guarded. By 1880, George Q. Cannon was clerk of the council. He had possession of the key to the box containing records of the kingdom of God. He was then in Congress, and he mailed the key back to Salt Lake City so that John Taylor, then president of the Quorum of the Twelve, and his fellow apostles Joseph F. Smith and Franklin D. Richards could read the minutes in preparation for a reconstitution of the council. When George Q. Cannon wrote the council for a second, for a second. in his... All right, this is 1880. Who knows what's going on in 1880? I'll go ahead and give you some... What is it? Have we got the echo turned off yet? Okay, there we go. So the Temple Lock case, right? And 1890, and, and they're all... You've got the Reed Smoot trials and all this sort of things going on with with the church being there, he's got a key to these notes. These are not just kind of sort of hidden, right? There is one key. He's in Washington, D.C., and being, I don't know, afraid they're going to search him and find the key or whatever, he mails it back to, to John Taylor, right, who is prophet during the whole polygamy thing, so that they can look at these notes to understand, to read and prepare, uh, I assume for the trials with the Reed Smoot uh, hearings. So, I mean, or this is not a, if we're not a tiny document. Yeah, go ahead. 
or prepare for the coming kingdom of God, since we are getting close to 1890. And there was that belief that, at the time true. that uh, the end of the world was going to be at that date. But uh, That could yeah. very well be what, what do you mean. I'm just trying to, to give a, maybe the, the, the best hope for thing. I don't know if that's likely or not, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Regardless, I, I I'm sure be... that the historian who is speaking knows more and has looked up why he would mail it back, and he's simply glossing over it. I think that's... Uh, yeah. There are some uh, fun details of the timeline that I would like to know more about. Uh, for instance, the, the digging up of the records occurred... Um, the records are buried just before the... Uh, just before Carthage, and then they're unburied just after Carthage. It's not really that long after. He said it was uh, early July, right? So we're looking at just a few weeks before. Even they're before in the Brigham. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right. Brigham and, and Sydney haven't been decided yet. Yeah. So why why are they dug out of the ground at that point? You know, and, and copied down. It, uh, there, there's some interesting things that I, I would like to, to know a lot more about. So I, I wonder if the timeline might add more context. Hmm. I think it's interesting that um, th these th documents are so secret that not even the the general twelve apostles have access to them. Not not even the prophet yeah. himself um, without the key. So um, it's kind of Canning like the was deep kind of running the church at the time, though. If if you look at a, a lot of that that particular history, hmm. the the, pr the presence of the church were pr pretty old, um, and and also in hiding quite quite often. Yeah, in hiding, um, they're in the underground. Yeah, Cannon is, is, issue. yeah. He Cannon's kind of pretty much. He's like Hinckley during uh, the the 1980s and 90s. He, he's mm -hmm. pretty much the power behind everything. So it kind of makes sense yeah. that he would hold on to the key. Um, but yeah, no, it, it definitely shows the, uh, the the power inherent in the first presidency as opposed to the. There's drone. another aspect that comes to mind, and that is that George Q. Cannon is the financial backer, along with, with Heber J. Grant, and I wonder whether the Council of the Fifty ties very closely to who had money and power in Utah at this at this time. I would love to see who was on the Council and who the, the who's who. I will bet that when Heber J. Grant goes around trying to get money here in 1893 for the bank that burned down the Utah Loan and Trust and all that sort of thing, probably the members of the Council of Fifty that he's hitting up first. Hmm. But I don't know that. It just strikes me. Well, we may maybe we'll find out when we see the minutes. All right, so let's keep going. Hello. Okay, i got to switch over to QuickTime. Colonel, or in his letters to Joseph F. Smith, he used another code using the Hawaiian word for 50 to conceal what he was talking about. Probably a little bit more effective than Willard Richards. Uh, At some point there are... One thing that I do want to point out is that, uh, that uh, Cannon's use of Hawaiian, Hawaiian is... I'm having an echo, sorry. sorry. Uh, it's one thing that has led to some questions in regards to these sources. Um, there are certain parts that have been untranslated in some of the, the few notes of Cannon's that have been released because he talks about, you know, certain temple rituals and things like that. Uh, I would be very interested to see in the released minute if they're going to be uh, actually releasing in the images uh, the actual original Hawaiian that, that he's writing. Although I, I say that out loud, and I, I believe the minutes that are going to be releasing, aren't they just 44 through 46? Yeah. Never mind. I'm just going to ask you. Yeah, that may be Canon's journal that you're talking about, which would be a Yeah, Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah. let's keep going. Go on. So the minutes still that collection. Uh, say some. What were you saying, Ken? Were you saying, Ken? I was going to say that may be part of why the secrecy. If the temple rituals are written in there, and in you know even if they're in Hawaiian, that could actually account for um, why they're keeping it under such lock and key. Yeah. Because they would ask why they would reveal such a thing anyway. You know. Uh, well, it, it may make reference to. to the Protestant minister and different parts of the ceremony that are no longer there. Interesting. Right. Um, any reason why they would talk about such a thing when a group that had non-members present? Well, I don't know if, if he's referring to that being part of the Council of Fifty or part of Abraham Cannon or uh, Cannon's. Oh, George uh, Cannon's diary. George I... Cannon's diary. Yeah. Just okay. So let's see what to use Hawaiian to uh, as his code. 
Yeah. Okay. I see. All right, let's keep going. going. First presidency. Where they remained throughout the 20th and early 21st centuries until they were transferred to the Church History Department's collections in 2010. 20, in 2013, the Church announced that the First Presidency had authorized publication of the minutes. Since that time, a team of historians, including myself, Ron Esplin, Mark Ashers McGee, Garrett Dirkmod, and Jeff Mayhaas, have worked on the minutes, along with the Joseph Smith Papers' excellent editorial team led by Eric Smith. We're excited that in just a few weeks, anyone who has wanted to speculate or wanted to know anything about the minutes or the Council of Fifty can do so in great detail. And I'll just say... I think it's worth I pausing it's there, worth pausing there yeah. saying that we all we are all really are grateful really that they're finally, finally making this, making this yeah. available. Yeah. Now, granted, they're doing it in a in way, way where they get to tell, tell church, church members how to, how to interpret, interpret different things. things. In a, in a faithful, faithful way. way. They're, they're not, not just not saying, saying here are the minutes. They're, they're, they're saying, saying here are the minutes, minutes and check out all those footnotes because those footnotes are going to set the tone for what it means to be prophet, priest, and king. They're going to set the tone for why there was so much secrecy. And they're going to tell people how to keep a faithful perspective. And That's we saw right. that in the first five minutes of him saying, these are old thoughts, that the church doesn't do that anymore. Yeah, they're totally, That's that, you're right. That's what they're doing it's, here. Dispensations within dispensations. You know, it's kind of a Frank Herbert. <laughs> and we'll never right. see the minutes, probably from the 1860s and so on, but yeah. Who knows? This is. Uh, maybe yeah, so I look forward to the Brigham Young like paper. Three <laughs> minutes that are difficult to read. William Clayton writes in complete sentences here. They're, they're, they, they flow, they're easy to read. Uh, they're really terrific. Go William. Go Let me William. show you a few more pictures. Here's the title page. Record of the Council of Fifty or the Kingdom of God, 1844. The rest of the writing there is an index that was made later on. It's not a religious organization. It's just called the Kingdom of God, the Council of the Kingdom of God. Here's the first page. The council was organized on the strength of the contents of two letters from the brethren in the pine country. Talk about that in a minute. Oh, okay. They made a list of the members of the council. Number one, President Joseph Smith, standing chairman. Number two, Samuel Bent, Born 1775, number three, John Smith, born 1781. They organized themselves in the council according to age, except for Joseph Smith, who was the standing chairman. Of course, of course. The list continues. So when and why was the council established? In March 1844, Joseph Smith received two letters from the Brethren in the Pine Country, men who had been sent to the Wisconsin Pineries to gather lumber for the Nauvoo Temple and the Nauvoo House. As they finished, they wrote him letters and said, perhaps we should be sent not to Nauvoo when we return, but to somewhere else to help establish the kingdom of God, to explore new settlements. And so Joseph okay, Smith convened... Okay. So let's just consider so let's just our, our, our analogy, analogy with, with sorry, we got the feedback again, uh, with either Trump or Hillary. We can take either one. Now imagine, now imagine that uh, uh, you find out that Trump's campaign group that is helping to put together his, his campaign is going to start an extrajudicial or an extra outside of the U.S. country if he loses his bid for the presidency of the United States. Or, or the other side, if you find out that if Hillary doesn't win, she's going to leave the United States and start her own country. How, how would that make you feel as, as far as a voter, as far as someone who's watching their campaign? He is setting up a campaign for presidency through the same group, while at the same time they are investigating setting up a, a, a country in opposition of the United States. I mean, flag pins aside on Obama's run, this is crazy levels of, 
of uh, approach to, to running for president. Agreed. But it follows the pattern that he has of uh, just moving, moving. And, and the guy's going to frame it like, well, we're looking for religious liberty, but he's showing the same behavior that a con artist who's just looking to escape accountability before the law right, shows. He point. wants to get away from um, you know, that accountability. And even like if you look at, uh, what is it, the People's Temple and, and the whole Jim Jones thing, you know, they, they went to Guyana so that they were not subject to the laws of the United States. Same with Scientology, right? They... Oh. Sorry. No, I, was, I was just going to ask, do either of you know too much about the content of these actual letters from Wisconsin? Which I find I don't. So odd just in the random, maybe not random, I don't know, but seemingly random connection with uh, a certain claimant after, during the succession crisis also uh, from the Wisconsin fine countries. Well, stop teasing us. What are you talking about? Uh, it, it, I, am I... This might be where I, I'm really embarrassed for getting it all wrong. Isn't that where um, uh, Strain is currently operating at this point in time? That's a that's a dark shadow of Mormon history I haven't oh. explored yet. Oh, okay. But that's an interesting um, thought. It seems like the letter, because he goes into it later in the talk, um, is, is basically trying to identify places that would be the next migration point uh, if they came to it. Um, Kind of second, setting up a secondary base that they could retreat to if they needed to. Yeah, so to, to run away from the law if one wanted to go there. Um, well, exactly. I, I mean, say, when you think about, go ahead, Ken. Uh, the Scientology. They also they set up a boat outside on on marital waters mm -hmm. uh, because then there was maritime law and they could do whatever they wanted, including locking people up. Um, it sounds a lot like that sort of concept that they could. You can escape the laws of all countries if you, I mean, if Joseph Smith, I guess what I'm saying is if he were to do this in the 1960s, we would expect him to, to build a boat yeah. and take everybody off outside of jurisdiction. Yeah, there's just Thanks. there's too many similarities with the whole avoiding legal accountability. And they'll frame it like it's persecution, like, oh, you know, he, he's being persecuted. But, you know, it, how do you tell the difference between that and somebody who did actually break the law who's trying to escape accountability for that? So kind of takes uh, your perspective. If you think Just he's a, a prophet, quick note, then it's persecution. Googling this phrase does not turn up any letters. It is not anywhere on Google. You cannot just grab these. Um, really? Well, we'll have to publish them. Yeah. Maybe they'll be actually part of the, uh, the, the book itself. We'll see. I, this is, I'm going to really quickly, this is just a pet peeve with, with apologists. Make all the sources available when you do your speech, because if you don't, it looks like you're hiding things. You, yes, you have access to the secret knowledge, but but come on, make it so that everyone else can read everything you're saying, or else it's not kosher. It's it's yeah. It's anyway. It's an old. It, it's it a me. it's a relic of the old way of presenting things. I agree completely. I mean, in the modern digital age, there should be no reason that you don't have all your source. I mean, we you basically have to be like WikiLeaks with your stuff. Make the source available. Let people judge it on their own and uh, go. All right. Yeah. So this brought together thoughts that he'd already been having, and the minutes record that in that initial council meeting, all seemed agreed to look to some place where we can go and establish a theocracy, either in Texas, or in Oregon, or somewhere in California. Okay, I just want to point out that enough. theocracy is, is completely repellent to any, uh, like <laughs> anyone outside of the small, you know, conclave of people that revere Joseph Smith as a, as a prophet. I mean, you, you go looking at the Federalist Papers, you look at everything, and they all talk about how, you know, that is not the type of a government rule that is free from corruption. It, it's inherently corrupt. No, 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 no. This, this, is, this is theocratic democracy. I mean, it's entirely different. It's like the United <laughs> Order. It, you know, that's not communism at all. That's entirely different. It's, yeah. All viewpoints are going to be respected, except if you expose the leaders in a newspaper, which we then get destroyed and destroyed. run you out of town. Yeah. Yeah, or if you, you know, decide to leave said church and then get run out of town afterwards, which he's even going to mention if we ever actually get to the end of this. Well, let's <laughs> keep going. You're going then. to. 
you're going to be run out of town democratically, hmm. theo-democratically. Is it true? <laughs> Why were church leaders so enthusiastic about their proposal to establish a new settlement? Oh, what oh, do oh, Texas, oh, Oregon, and... One more thing, and that is we've already had the Rocky Mountain over a barrel vision at this point. The, he's, he was outside of the Masonic Lodge, and uh, everyone got to go in except for him, and he felt really slighted. It's supposed to be back in 1842, a couple years before. Um, and so while they all go in, including his brother Hiram, he takes a drink out of a barrel of water and says, Brethren, I'm, I'm tasting the water straight from the Rockies as though I were there. And he gives this big vision, Joseph Smith, of course, uh, about going to the Rocky Mountains. And the apologists will hang their hat. There are books published and, and lots of papers. I've spent way too long uh, reading all the different sources that, where they verify this happened to prove that by that point they had settled on the Rockies. So this letter of 1844 not mentioning the Rockies should be seen as really significant. Oregon, Texas, California, I mean, those are where the, the bad Mormons went, right? We know that the people went by boat and stopped in California. Brannon, who founded San Francisco, those were the lesser. But, but here we have Joseph Smith and the letters going back and forth saying that those were the places considered. That's really fascinating to me. Okay, go on. All right. You history nerds know too much. All right. <laughs> California have in common? They were outside the boundaries of the United States. Why it. did they want to form a new kind of government? The, perhaps the primary reason is the persecution the saints had experienced in Missouri in the 1830s. This is driven key. from he Jackson County. Word, he uses the word perhaps. He's speculating here. Absolutely. He, no, he doesn't give any evidence for this whole next section. I just love the way he phrased the question. Why did they want to have a whole new form of government where the prophet would not be challenged by any legal authority at all because he would <laughs> own both civil and religious and military and judicial authority all in one seat? Why would he want that? <laughs> maybe. Why does any maybe it has autocratic... to do with bad guys. Why does any, any, uh, any tyrant want complete domination? Because that's what they want. Anyway, all right. Crazy eyes on. But, but, but I, thought that, I thought that the protections of the Constitution you know, were, were divinely instituted to protect the church. Uh, that's what I was told, that the church would never rise in a place like Britain, where it found wild success once missionaries showed up. But, you know, it would never have been able to survive in Britain. But, uh, See, the cross signal we're going to get all this is they'll say, no, theodemocracy works because you have men who are chosen by God at the head. And so, you know, whereas Thomas Jefferson said, you know, if, if we were governed by angels, we wouldn't need laws. Well, these are going to be angels. And so it's okay that they have absolute power. Now, when you bring up problems with the prophets, they'll say, oh, well, they're, they're just men. They can make mistakes. They're subject to the same frailties as you or I. But... We can trust them to be, be theocratic tyrants because they're chosen. It's, right, it's a complete they're disconnect. Beyond corruption, so yeah, yeah. They have All the right, words. They have the best words. They're going to build a wall <laughs> and make the United States pay for it. Uh, that's true. And then completely expelled from the state in 1838-39 under order of the Missouri governor. Repeated attempts by the saints thing, to secure protection... What's that? Oh, I, I, I will totally agree with, with Mormon leaders. The, the expulsion from Missouri is probably not, not a good thing. I'm not going to excuse let, the behavior on both Thomas. sides, but uh, and I, I'm going to agree that, uh, that that's probably not the best that America has in terms of its history. Let's take a look at what happened to Thomas B. Marsh and, and Orson Hyde really quickly, though, mm -hmm. uh, who yeah. signed a statement saying that Joseph Smith went too far Right? They signed an affidavit. What happened to them? They were excommunicated two days after. So when you think theocratic democracy, uh, we already see where, where Joseph will go early yeah. on before any of this is being discussed. He, he'd throw them out. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to see what degree of freedom, what degree of, a, of an enlightened society that you have, look at how dissenters are treated. Because if a dissenter is allowed to voice something and allow his ideas to stand or fall on their own without 
physical repercussion, coercion, or intimidation, then that can be a free society. But if as soon as you you articulate any dissent from the the power structure, you're kicked out or punished in any way, then that that shows you you know if you want to figure out who is the tyrant, see who you can't criticize. All right, let's keep going. Redress through legal means were largely unsuccessful. These experiences left them deeply convinced of the inability and unwillingness of governments to protect the rights of unpopular religious minorities. At this time, the United States Bill of Rights protected it against abuses by only the federal government, not state and local governments meaning that federal officials refused to intervene to protect rights at local levels. Like abolitionists and members of other maligned movements who had suffered at the hands of majority opinion, Latin Okay, the fact that he's bringing them in the same group as abolitionists <laughs> is just kind of, it's, he, he's trying to, to hang on the coattails of an actually, fair, you know, principally group you know, there were some violent abolitionists, but there were also a large number of abolitionists that took very principled nonviolent stands uh, on the idea that no man can own another, and there are implications for that. Um, the, the difficulty with that, all religious liberty is not the same. Yeah, states' rights versus federal rights, and to bring that in there, I mean, yes, that played a part into the whole persecution thing, but there's a lot of good reasons not to have a, a federal government say, Take care of your health care. Having one big federal organization do that. Typically, Mormons have a problem with Obamacare. Not all of them, grant me, but, uh, but it's a common issue that my relatives bring up. What's another big federal issue that they, that, uh, oh, education, right? The Department of Education and people who homeschool in Utah. I, he's making an appeal that is inherently against, I think, the mainstream of the, uh, certainly the John Birch slash Ezra Taft Benson Skousen view of, of how Mormonism should go, as well as, uh, you know, it's just, it's amazing to me he can say this with a straight face and not say things like, even though I know many of you really like states' rights, or this is really important that states have rights, we shouldn't encroach on the federal. You know, we've got here in Utah, there is a where's the line political movement to push back on the federal rights. And yet here he's saying that the real problem, the reason for persecution wasn't the Mormons were doing bad things, or the reason you need to leave the United States is that there was a weak federal. It just blows my mind. All right. Well, to counter what you're saying, I think what he's alluding to is that even though there are, uh, the Constitution has the Bill of Rights at this point, which protects certain things, that the federal government isn't, apply, isn't using its own power to protect those Bill of Rights um, and, and that's kind of a confined circle rather than looking at things like federal health care and things like that. They're looking at, at constitutional-based rights. Right, but the, the constitutional-based right that they're trying to get away with is to throw everything under the First Amendment and freedom of religion that you can engage in polygamy with minors. Eh. No, uh, I, I agree uh, with you totally. <laughs> and that, that's where we get to the... We're seeing that today, too, where you're making the case that you can you can take illegal or bigoted or whatever activities and teaching, put them under the umbrella of religion, and then expect to be able to be free to, to do what you want in that regard. Ever. Now, it's a little... Yeah, exactly. Now, and, and back then, when you look at what was actually done, the, the actual criminal things in terms of the child brides and things like that, you know, if, if we saw Warren Jeffs looking to making the case that his rights were being infringed upon because he couldn't marry and have sex with 12-year-olds, we'd look at him and we'd say, you're an idiot, you're trying to claim religious protection for illegal and immoral activities. And most of the people probably saw Joseph Smith making the same case. Yeah, I mean, maybe we should use that as the uh, the, the, the standard going forward versus Trump-Hillary. Let's use uh, Warren Jeffs, if he were running for president and doing these activities, how comfortable would you be with uh, with the current excuse, uh, well, the FLDS were 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 treated poorly. That's why they needed to leave the United States and start their own country. Just you know, as yeah. as a comparison. Exactly. They think sought changes that would restore what they saw as a proper balance to America's political system. Joseph Smith and others had designed the government of the city of Nauvoo to provide protections the Latter-day Saints had lacked during the 1830s. 
the Nauvoo Municipal Charter, granted by the state of Illinois in 1840, was intended to guard against many of the institutional wrongs the saints had experienced. For example, the charter authorized the creation of a separate militia, the Nauvoo Legion, and gave the Nauvoo City Court far-reaching authority, which the saints had used to protect themselves from what they perceived as unjust legal actions. After failing to we, we have to point out, as they perceived, again, he's gone to opinion, there weren't extra legal actions, or maybe there were, but he doesn't address that. It's just perceived extra legal actions. Uh, it's interesting the words that he chooses and where he puts them in. Also, the militia. Yes, the Nauvoo Charter allowed him to create an army one-third the size of the United States Army. Imagine if Warren Jeffs created a city and gave himself a charter that allowed him to create a military one-third the size of, maybe not the United States, because we have a really big military now, but let's ch say Germany. Anyone going to be comfortable with that if, uh, if, if Short Creek down here uh, in southern Utah just started amassing people and marching them back and forth with guns? It just, he plays it off as a minor thing. They were protecting themselves from perceived wrongs. And it's not protecting them. So I think it's actually, not, it's actually it's actually honest. He's being honest. He says when he says that it's perceived wrongs, perceived persecution, he's allowing for the possibility that they weren't actually wrongs and persecutions. They were legitimate actions by law enforcement trying to hold a criminal accountable. And and so yeah. it's actually it's mm -hmm. it's honest that he's doing it even though to the audience that he's talking to, he's feeding their bias. Right. I I just don't like the use of the plural when we're really talking about a singular individual. So, I agree completely because the protections he's talking about is habeas corpus and basically yeah. Joseph Smith used that to uh, escape extradition so that he could be held accountable for you know assassination attempts on governor's Bo on governor Boggs for things that went down in Missouri and um, I'm not really familiar with any time that the Nauvoo courts had any particular you know ever found anything in particular in terms of protections for regular members. So. I mean, Nauvoo became a place where other individuals came to escape the law, so there is that. Uh, I don't know that that's a, a great argument for a good theocratic democracy government being set up, but they did have a high criminal content because they could basically get away with anything. Especially counterfeiting. Yeah, well. Including counterfeiting, yes. Yeah. All right, let's continue receive assurances from the expected main candidates in the upcoming presidential election in 1844 that the saints' rights would be protected, Joseph Smith declared his candidacy for president of the United States. His platform emphasized, as do his remarks in the Council of Fifty, a commitment to protect the minority rights of all, not just Latter-day Saints, against what they saw as the tyranny of the majority. By March of that year, significant opposition was growing to the church in and around Nauvoo, in part because of the practice of plural marriage and the saints' growing political power. Members of the council were, were drawn both to the possibility of relocating significant numbers of the saints outside of the United States, where they could create their own government, and to the possibility of creating a better government in the United States. Okay, they discussed... So Polygamy was illegal. Let's not just say polygamy. The secret illegal practice that is going on that they are trying to hush up. That's the reason that they're looking for an extra legal government. Just call it what it is. Uh, it's not just, oh, the rumors of or that there was polygamy going on. No, he was, he was hushing up that people were coming in from England and, and far away. Uh, and, and that they were being suddenly surprised and shocked and, and given in marriage and, and angels with swords, and there's just a whole bunch into this, uh, and, and that it was illegal uh, wherever it was practiced, and they want to run away from, from the consequences, really, of their actions. Now, Warren Jeffs just wants to find a place where he can be free of persecution, and he can be free to practice his religion, where he can consummate marriages with 13-year-old children on the temple altar. You know, and if, if he, he's going to try to run for president and make that work, but if it doesn't work, then we've got to have this haven that we can go to so we can practice our religion. You know, that's where the that's difference all the is. the minorities right. who want to do 
Are they escaping accountability for criminal activity that is criminal not just because it's legal but because it's immoral? Or are they actually being persecuted? All right. Length, the nature of the kingdom of God, theocracy, and Joseph Smith's role as leader of the church and council. Now, for most contemporary Americans, theocracy connoted the tyrannical rule of religious leaders. Rightly so. Conjured images of the collusion of Catholicism with European governments and seemed the opposite of American democracy. However, Joseph Smith and other council members believed that theocracy could be fused with the best elements of democracy, a system that he... By putting the beginning of one word in front of the end of the other word, you can have theodemocracy, but if you look at the actual details of how it's run, it is absolute theocracy. It's, it's, it's theocratic tyranny. And if you want to see how the nuts and bolts of this work, if you go to the Thoughts on Things and Stuff's blog, there's an article called The Anatomy of Theodemocracy where it looks at the actual procedures for how the councils of power are run. And when you actually look at the details of it, you can see that Joseph Smith, as the standing chairman, has absolute control. And there's this veneer, and they toss around words like democracy and voting, but the practical rubber hits the road of how the procedures run is absolute subordination to the will of the chairman. And we need to go no further than a conference or two ago where, uh, what was it, three people said that they, uh, they, they did not sustain the brethren and the anger and, the, and, and, and everything that came out, even if there were a real vote uh, under theodemocracy, uh, anyone who who didn't support the prophet, we can see what would happen with them. It doesn't even exist in the church today, even though there's no consequence. No one was removed from power. There was no play out uh, other than just people got really angry at the three people who dared to defy the prophet, even in a when they asked for a, a dissenting vote. I think right. you can see very easily how it would play out. Yep, exactly. Publicly described during his campaign for the presidency as theodemocracy. He said, I go emphatically, virtuously, and humanely for a theodemocracy, where God and the people hold the power to conduct the affairs of men in righteousness. He said that this would protect liberty and freedom for the benefit of all. Council members reiterated that a system that blended theocracy with democracy would protect the rights of minority groups, allow for dissent and free discussion, involve Latter-day Saints and others in hopes of increasing righteousness in preparation for Christ's second coming. Sydney so the members of the council revealed that they have z no clue about human nature and, and no clue about government. Because if you put all of the power in one seat, all of these things go away. I mean, it's it's just right. Yeah, I, you I have a, go ahead, in, Tom. In Britain, you have a you know you have a constitutional monarchy, and what that is is you get the democracy and the monarchy working together by limiting the power of one. There's no limitation on the power of the theocracy side of of, of this sort of equation of saying we'll have God and men work together somehow. There's no limitation on one. And so, as soon as you have a guy saying, God will. is telling me, and I am God's spokesperson, and you have it in this rigid hierarchy, then anyone who dissents is, can, can be said to be dissenting from God. And the, the degree of power conferred upon the person who claims to be God's spokesman is, is without any check at all. And, and I suspect it's these issues that lead to what he's about to talk about, where they try to write a constitution, and they, they, they can't even do that. Yeah, true. All right, let's keep going. And stated, the design was to form a theocracy according to the will of heaven, planted without any intention to interfere with any government in the world. You to see one. Every theocracy uses that same argument. I have a divine right. I am going to take God's will and make it. I mean, there is no difference 
You just toss around things like, oh, we're going to protect the will of the innocent and the minorities. You're not going to protect the minorities. You have in Nauvoo a minority who break away from the church and say Joseph Smith is a fallen prophet. They don't protect their rights. They immediately stomp over their rights. And you, when you hear stories about that, you know, what, and he's going to bring it up later, what they do with dissenters in, in terms of running them out of town, that's not protecting the rights of the minorities. That's simply... You have to protect my right to be and my privilege uh, as a believer over people who would squash my right to believe with facts and truth. Well, exactly. The only minority you're protecting is Joseph Smith's individual minority to claim power over everyone. I'm sure they would allow dissenters the right to, you know, work at a place, uh, you know, have their own homes and that sort of thing, as long as it didn't conflict with uh, who was in charge. They could marry whoever they wanted, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let's keep going. <laughs> Sorry. Do not fear that we design to trample on the rights of any man or set of men, only to seek the enjoyment of our own rights. Joseph Smith likewise considered that a theocracy consisted in our exercising all the intelligence of the council and bringing forth all the light which dwells in the breast of every man. Theocracy is for the people to get the voice of God and then acknowledge it and to see it executed. And who gives them the voice of God? The man at the top. Because if anyone dissents and says that's not the voice of God, then you're on the outs. I mean, it's just... The fact that he's sitting there and making this case with a straight face is deeply offensive to me. I mean, does he not understand the history? Ah. So there's another aspect that he's lost over very, very cunningly. That is the light of men in, in their breasts, and that is that those who leave the church are often described, even today, as darkened. Right? It's, it's a common slur that is used. Oh, you're not as bright anymore. You don't know as much. So, so, you know, William Law, he had to be run out because the light of man, or whatever that means, is, is gone from him or, or whatever. Um, you know, this is a, a great way to demonize anyone that we need the light of men, so you're going to have to leave and or die. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's keep going. Joseph Smith and other members of the Council of Fifty believed that the Council would serve as the government of the Kingdom of God both before and after the second coming of Jesus Christ. In their view, not... That is so dangerous. I mean, that is just like... Because basically what he's saying is you can look at the parliamentary procedure of this Council and they're telling you that when Christ comes, that's what's going to be. And, and when you... Something for Sunday school, yeah. What's that? We should study this in Sunday school, shouldn't we? Well, you, exactly. You, this should be like, you know, if you want to know how it's going to be when Christ returns, that should be a major topic of Sunday school. But we're going to keep that secret in the minutes of this organization that's not a religious organization per se, even though it's how Christ is going to govern. Anyway. To the credit of my All seminary teacher, women, either before the second... Say again? Uh, to the credit of my seminary teacher, the next statement is... Uh, he actually said that there would be people who did not believe in the church after the millennium. That's what we're about to hear about, and that they would be part of this organization as well. So he got that part right. All right, let's check it out. Or after would be church members. They emphasized that everyone would enjoy religious liberty in, in the kingdom of God. Joseph Smith invited three men who were not members of the church to join the council to demonstrate the importance of religious liberty and equal rights to the council. Okay, three men, three, three non-members. Uh, now, I'm sure, I'm sure he worked really hard. You know, these are people who represent the, the best of the community, right? Because this, this is supposed to be the government of God. And so if we're going to be inviting people in from the outside, these have to be people who deserve to be there, right? These have to be upstanding, great people who... You know, we, we shouldn't be surprised to find them on a list like this, right? That's right. So now, now people before, like before you say before you say it, I want you to picture who Trump and Hillary would pick if they were picking a cabinet. Would it be the three most religious people, the three most honest people, 
or three people that there were favors and money connected to. Just think for that for a second, and now go ahead and reveal. Well, and also imagine that today Elder Holland gave a talk where he made a very strong case that the only source of moral fortitude and moral principle is religion. And, and so you would expect them to be very religious people, even if they weren't Mormon. So you've got yeah. Edward Bonney, non-Mormon, counterfeit, counterfeiter, uh, also Freemason. Um, then you've got uh, a, an individual by the name of, let's see if I can find it, um, Uriah Brown, who claimed to have invented a weapon that uh, could potentially overcome even the U.S. Navy. Um, and then you've got an, another individual who uh, was a known counterfeiter as, as well. I can't find his uh, his name right off the bat, but you've got you know two people who are are known counterfeiters, and then one guy who's potentially going to be able to equip them to do battle with the U.S. military if they need to. I mean, get it? I, I would have Tony Stark on my team if I could get him, but. But there is a moral question even there. Is that who, who God would choose? Is uh, the arms dealer uh, and, and the two counterfeiters? I find it just fascinating. Someone who could provide the buck. Right. Well, and it's, so it's this is the government that's going to exist when Christ is here. So those are going to be Christ's, you know, the, his, yeah. his... If he had shown up in 1845, we should expect these three guys to still be in their chairs, right? That's a very good point. I'd still take him over Palin. <laughs> on, All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> you betcha. Council members also attempted to write a constitution for the kingdom of God that would reflect these principles of theodemocracy. Good luck. The council's name, which was given in a revelation during the council meeting, suggests a mix of political purpose and religious symbolism. The kingdom of God and his laws with the keys and power thereof and judgment in the hands of his servant and the hands of his servants. Council members often used an abbreviation. That is such a scary title. I mean, if you, yeah. if you can think of some religious organization, some offshoot group that says they are the possessors and the conduit of God's law, which is higher than man's law, and that they are the you know they're the ones who are going to execute that judgment. That's the setup for people to get away with all sorts of abuses and believe that they're righteous for doing so, like you know murdering a a, a, a wagon train of innocent people that pass through or something like that. That would never happen. Go on. It's yeah, I think this we revealed should, name. Referring to what's that? We should we should forever change the name of the Council of Fifty. I don't think it's fair to keep it that name. I really think we should call it the Council of the Kingdom. I think it illustrates what it really was. That this was to set up a kingdom. It, the Council of Fifty makes it sound like just another council, but really this was about establishing a kingdom. And he admits it full on here. Full, full on here. This is yeah. about a theo-democracy, whatever that means, but essentially a religious kingdom, and that was its purpose. And I don't think we should let historians get away with, like, oh, it was a council of 50 people, some of them were non-Mormons. It was a council to establish a separate country run as a kingdom, period. Right. And, and not only should that be a better term for it, but the, the term theo-democracy is c completely absurd. You know, when you look at the procedures, any vote that passes has to be unanimous. And when you look at the way that it works is that the, the motions are submitted by the chairperson, and then he makes a vote. And then in descending order by age, each member of the council makes a vote. And if they do not support the, the, the councilman's vote, then they have to explain their reasons why. And if they don't continue, to, if they persist, not supporting the president's vote, they have to withdraw from the council and they're out of that body. And so massive, th that's not democracy. Peer pressure. That's not democracy. That's absolute autocratic tyranny. And That's the right. thing. Let's keep going. <laughs> council by such titles as the kingdom, the kingdom of God, or council of the kingdom of God. 
After the council reached a membership of 50 men, Joseph Smith declared that it was full, and then it got the nickname of Council of 50. Notice they voted. It was oh, wait, no. <laughs> they voted to have 50 members. No, no, no. It was theocratically declared that 50 was full, therefore it was full. I just want to point out the whole theodemocracy has such a thin layer because there okay. is no moment through the rest of the speech where he says, and they voted. The rest of the time, it's, and Joseph Smith said to do this, that, and yeah. the other. Right, and, and again, you look at the, the thing. If anyone disagreed with him, if they didn't change their opinion to agree with him, they were out. And, yeah. and so that tells you everything you need to know. The day of the, of the council's organization that Joseph Smith appointed four men to draft a constitution for the, for the council, which would be perfect and embrace those principles which the Constitution of the United States lacked. They criticized the U.S. Constitution for not protecting liberty with enough vigor. The initial month and a half of this council, this committee repeatedly gives a report of their constitution writing. They began by imitating the United States Constitution, we the people of the kingdom of God. But they also were clearly not making very good pro progress. This was a difficult task. Okay, I got I got I got a lunch in and I'm almost out of battery here. So I don't know if we're going to be able to do the whole thing, but uh, two things. One is, have you ever seen Mormon-created board games? I have a friend who is totally into board games, and he has a collection of all Mormon-created board games. And the truth is, is that there's not a, a, a creative element to any of them. They just take something like Settlers of Catan and make it in Zion, or they take Pursuit and add Celestial in front of it, that sort of thing. Uh, and what I see is the same same process happening here. There's no creativity. They're like, we're going to totally do a better constitution. <gasps> Explain to think for a minute if God actually gave a constitution. How awesome that would be. You have deity codifying how to treat other people. And it, it's hard. They can't figure it out. Joseph isn't able to like dictate it like he did the Book of Mormon and or the Doctrine and Covenants. That's fascinating to me. The second aspect that I, I can't get past uh, with, with um, uh, dang it, we the people, difficult. Oh, uh, the same thing happened with the law of consecration in Edward Partridge. Uh, Joseph says, go out and create this whole communistic, uh, commune-centered uh, utopia. System, utopia, and he keeps writing back. If you look at the, uh, there's a blog that is done by his descendants, of Edward Partridge's descendants. And, and they have the letters back and forth where he's begging Joseph, give me some more guidance. How do I handle the poor? You're sending too many poor. What should I do? The, the neighbors are getting restless that we're setting up tents on their doorsteps. Things like that. And, and Joseph gives him no guidance. And I see a very similar pattern here. Go create a constitution. Uh, it's hard. We don't have any answers. Uh, you know, you got to figure it out because this is divine decree. And meanwhile, I'm going to be over here with this girl that is, you know, maybe married to one of you. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. You figure if this, is gonna, if, this system, if this is going to be the system of law that Christ rules under, then the prophet would be the person who would most likely be able to know what that is because presumably it's going to be a product of God, not the product of men. All right, let's keep going. Finally, after the council, after the committee uh, brought forth a half-ranked constitution, Joseph Smith told them to let the constitution alone. He then dictated a revelation in the council. Verily, thus saith the Lord, ye are my constitution, and I am your God, and ye are my spokesmen. From because henceforth, unwritten rules always work. Again, this needs to be in Sunday school. We it's got just, another revolution it's like, here, right? It's, like a, stubborn, right? it's a literal yeah, deus ex machina of the Constitution question. Oh, we can't come up with something that's as divinely inspired as what you know Madison and, and all these other founding fathers came up with. So we're just going to say, you guys are our Constitution. You, the counterfeiter. You're the Constitution. You, the, the weapons dealer. Anyway. I, blows you away. Yeah. Yet he's just saying it, like, calmly. Oh, yeah, no, this is just fine. It yes. made sense. And, I, and again, no vote. No vote. It's totally what Joseph said that matters. 
Exactly. This guy who's giving this talk is an educated person. He is a, you know, he's got Ivy League credentials behind him. And I, I don't understand why he's not curled over with embarrassment that this is, you know, the guy that we revere as a prophet. Anyway, all right. Do as I shall command you, saith the Lord. In the midst of these discussions on governmental principles in the kingdom of God, Erastus Snow, in April 1844, moved that the council... Oh, yeah, where this will be. Moved that the council receive from this time henceforth Joseph Smith as our prophet, priest, and king. Now, just keep in mind that when he says that Erastus Snow moved it, when you look at the procedures that, that happen, he may have suggested it, but then he had to submit it in writing to Joseph Smith, and that motion could only be presented to the council through Joseph Smith himself. So Joseph Smith presented to the council that it's been moved that I be declared prophet, priest, and king. And I vote, because the, the, the president of the council got the first vote, I vote yes. Now, you, next in line, what do you vote? And then he's like, uh, yes, and then you, next in line. And, and so down, anyone, everyone, because it had to be unanimous, everyone voted yes. Okay, and I want you to just picture, I was just at a, a, a city council meeting a little while back. Picture this happening at a city council meeting where you're, you're discussing other issues, you're talking about the constitution for the city, and then some random person in the audience says, I motion that Joseph Smith become prophet, priest, and king. Uh, that would be really out of place. You'd think there'd be some discussion maybe, or there would be some sort of, I don't know, something. but it, this looks pre-planned. I'm sorry, this looks like someone maybe slipped or asked us, no, this is your job, you need to, to bring this forward. Yeah. Joseph could have done it himself. But this doesn't look like everyone, you know, there's no... There's no like long debate. What does this mean? What does the word right. king mean in this context? Which at any city council there would have been. Yeah, and, and not only that, but remember, the speaker has framed this entire discussion up until this point about the political world. This is this is we're not talking about you know clouds and 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 heavenly kingdoms. We're talking about political governance on earth involving Mormons and non-Mormons in our pluralistic society. So this let's see what he has to say. Locations. Yeah, because yeah. The, this whole so number one, prophet, priest, and king, gonna be major red flags to anyone who doesn't already revere Joseph Smith and think that his farts smell like divine approbation. And number two, um, prophet, priest, and king is the threefold title reserved for Christ in the minds of the entire Protestant world. And so for him to take that title is basically putting himself on par with Christ. And, and you can say, oh no, that's not what he really meant, but. That's when people hear that title. That is, you can look it up. That that the Protestant world. That's code for Christ. All right, let's keep going. Which is why I say there should have been some debate. Someone somewhere should have raised that and said, "Excuse me, this could be offensive." Some side group or something. But no. No. Also, right. it's a turbulent time, and uh, most of these meetings didn't have all fifty usually present at the same time. The, the, uh, they, they did have meetings with everyone there at the same time. I, I'd be interested to see uh, the role for this particular uh, this particular right. meeting. It, it'll be nice to, to get the minutes so, exactly. so we can see who was there, because I, I suspect that it's uh, certainly not all 50. Um, I can't see a unanimous vote passing with all 50. And, well, uh, if, if I recall correctly, there actually were standards for how many people had to be in session in order for them to conduct any business. Right. There had to be a quorum, but I don't know how big the quorum was supposed to be. Well, I want to say that I think that they required everyone to be there. But, really? Uh, okay. I'm, I'm just I know that was, a, that was an objection that someone raised later on after Joseph Smith died, that some vote had taken place, but not everyone was there. Uh, what were you, you going to say, Ken? A shout out to all those lessons where they talked about that we waste our time with we have all these inventions that do the laundry and and uh, and the dishes and we waste it doing other things than church stuff. I just want to point out this is a huge waste of time where they had to get everybody together, stop all the business. But the women, where are they? They are all doing the dishes. They're taking care of the kids. They're doing all the laundry so the men can get together because there were no women in the council of the kingdom. 
Hmm. That's true. Okay, yeah, actually, rule number seven, no member is to be absent from any meeting unless sick or on council business. If this were not the case, rule of five could be invoked to invalidate any action of the council. And so All I right, think when, when we, we get those the minutes, then we'll get more details. Uh, out at this point, though, sent by the, sent by the council of, of the kingdom, I'm going to start that as well, uh, they had been sent out at this point to uh, to canvas for um, the, the presidency at right. this point. So we, yeah, we so you're right. Some may everybody. have been absent. Still. All right. So, well, still, you know, what did it start yeah. in March? So what what is the uh, date? Yeah, where this, they... uh, this is in April. Um, crazy, crazy uh, April. All right. Snow's motion was unanimously accepted. Surprise. This action dramatically demonstrates this is the council members' views of theodemocracy and over which the ecclesiastical leader of the church, the prophet and priest, would be chosen by them as a political leader, king. Council participants understood that the action would have no immediate political consequences, but it symbolized their desire to prepare for the millennial kingdom of God. Now, don't forget, we've had other earthly kings for the world. Sung Young Moon of the Moonies was crowned king. In a, you know, he didn't even make it secret. You can actually watch the video of him accepting the kingship of the world on YouTube. But uh, that has nothing to do with Joseph Smith. No political consequences. Proclaiming Joseph Smith as a happen. prophet, priest. Yeah, this is not going to offend mean, anyone else. No. <laughs> but remember, they were uh, they were sworn to secrecy, so they could do stuff like this, and no one was going to know because, and they, and and if you read the minutes, it, it even says we don't tell our wives. And so right. all of these things are absolutely secret. And, and if anyone betrays it, we're going to cut off their head. That's the part that he's not saying with that whole no political consequences because it was completely secret. Exactly. King also reflected the temple ceremonies that he had introduced among the, his closest followers in the previous two years. In the view of Latter-day Saints, these ceremonies would allow men to one day become, in the words of John the Revelator, unto our God, kings and priests. Okay, so what he's doing now is he's doing the bait and switch. He's now saying, yep. when, when we say king, we're talking about these religious, spiritual things, and then he's adding validity to it by invoking John the Revelator. When, up until this point, we've been talking about the political kingdom on earth. So he's doing a little bit of political language here to try to smooth this over in the minds. And I think this, what we're seeing is how the church is telling members to frame these difficult revealing things that are in this book. We define everything. Yeah, yeah. When it's too political, it's religious. And when it's too religious, well, it's political. Yep. Very, very yeah, well stated. At 2216, he's about to say that the kingdom of God was understood as the work of the church in Revelation, but literally by the Council of Fifty. So he's going to go against everything he's about to say. He comes all the way around, and then he will say that that's not what it really meant, though. Yeah. He Let's knows. See. And he is... In July 1843, Joseph Smith taught that he would advance from prophet to priest and then to king, not to the kingdoms of this earth, but of the Most High. On April 8, 1844, a few days before the council received him as prophet, priest, and king, Joseph Smith urged the saints to finish building the Nauvoo Temple so that they could there receive their endowment to make them kings and priests unto the Most High God. He explained that this had nothing to do with temporal things, but was instead related to the kingdom of God. The beliefs that Joseph Smith had crowned himself king of an earthly theocracy spread among both dissidents within the church and opponents and observers outside the church. The accusations are in the Nauvoo Expositor, a newspaper published a few, months before, a few weeks before his uh, death that accused him of attempting to establish a theocracy. I just want to point out that he just said that Joseph Smith encouraged the temple to be built so that people could have their endowments and become priests and priestesses and kings and queens. That has nothing to do with the council of the kingdom or the council of 50. That, that's a separate thing within the endowment. But he's, he's now using that as the defense against the accusations that the expositor had, which were reality, which is that he was claiming his intention to take over the reins of government. So common were rumors in the summer of 1844 that Illinois Governor Thomas Ford placed the belief that Smith had caused himself to be crowned and anointed King of the Mormons first 
in a list of causes of excitement that led to Joseph's death. Some surely expect that there would be a description of a coronation in which Joseph crowned himself king of the world in the council of 50 minutes. Not so. Rather, his associates received him with the religious language of prophet, priest, and king. Now, now hang on there. Let's, let's pause. So my seminary teacher told, told me that that might be in there. These minutes were secret. The people were sworn to secrecy. And yet he's dispelling all of that as rumors. Is, is that fair? I mean, of course they were rumors. He couldn't confirm anything because it was all kept secret. Like, it, it's playing down. Thomas Ford heard that someone had been crowned king. There was a vote about being a king. Could you blame him for wondering? Well, and and anyway. this is supposed to be the government that's going to be on this side and that side of of the the, the coming the coming coming of Christ. Uh, it, it, isn't it going to stick? Isn't he going yeah. to be prophet, priest, and king on this side and on that side? Or, or right? Is he, and isn't is it Christ going to be that, prophet, priest, and king? Isn't and it isn't that kingdom over king? the whole world? So, like all the objections this person just had, minimizing it, were actually true. You know, he wasn't talking about you know the council of the kingdom of this little area in Nauvoo. Right. And and when Christ returns, we're just going to rule over this tiny little area. They were talking about the world. Yeah, it's not, and it's they're talking about. Go ahead. They're talking about leaving the United States to set it up, yeah. uh, and setting up a president of the United States uh, through an election campaign. I mean, it's seriously downplaying it to say there were rumors. Uh, there were more than rumors. <laughs> right, and he's he's playing the the straw man fallacy thing where he's saying, you know, they thought that there was going to be a coronation described in these minutes. Well, it, no, you're setting up like the monarchy in England. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be with a pope and, and a crown. Just the fact that there was a vote held and that they received him with religious language. I mean, you think the king in, in the monarch in England is not received with religious pomp and circumstance? It, it's all drenched in this. So he set up a, a false straw man about uh, you know how this wasn't what people were thinking in terms of him being crowned king of the world. And that's exactly, in effect, what it was going to be. Right, so these are minutes, you know. All right, let's keep going. The establishment of the council also reflected Latter-day Saints' interest in American Indians and in the West. As early as 1831, when federal Indian agents denied permission to the four initial Mormon missionaries sent to preach to Indians in what is now Kansas, the missionaries contemplated taking their message to the Rocky Mountains, if necessary, in order to be with the Indians. The Mormon interest in American Indians and in the West framed many of the Council's discussions. As tensions grew in Nauvoo, and, and we all know how Saints that played out for the Indians. What's that? <laughs> we all know how that played out for the Indians. I mean, when they got there, it was all hugs and blankets, and everyone was just having a great old time. There was no, you know, Paiute war. There was no. Uh, accusations that Brigham Young was putting glass in flour and killing them. There was nothing like that. So glad that we have, you know, whatever. whatever. Well, at Go least on. they moved on beyond we're going to take them as plural brides. I think that was a few years <laughs> earlier. All right, let's keep going. Interest in the West gained urgency. The West had already figured in the American imagination as a place of refuge and redefinition. A year before, newspaper editor John O'Sullivan proclaimed it the manifest destiny of the United States to spread across the continent. The saints were contemplating these new settlements in California and Oregon and Texas. Joseph wanted them to be able to go to a new place, to build a city in a day and have a government of our own in a healthy climate. In addition, Biblical prophecies and Joseph Smith's revelations established the context for Latter-day Saint thinking on the kingdom of God. Council members emphasized the prophecy in Daniel that God would set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, which shall be as a stone cut out of the mountain without hands that would fill the earth. Because religious charlatans and cult leaders never appeal to the Bible to justify their policies and their teachings. And it's not as though that revelation's about, you know, the, the Maccabean, you know, the dynasty or anything like that either. You know, that, that would just be silly. 
Here it comes. Here comes the line. Joseph's about to say that he's about to undo all that stuff about temples. Here it comes. Oh, okay. The saints did not believe that they were simply creating another denomination within the ranks of Christianity. Rather, they believed that Daniel's prophecy referred to the Latter-day Church and Kingdom of God. Several of Joseph Smith's revelations spoke of the Kingdom of God and contributed to the eventual establishment of the Council of Fifty. Early revelations commanded converts to seek the Kingdom of God. In October 1831, Revelation, paraphrasing Daniel, declared the keys of the kingdom of God is committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is hewn from the mountain without hands shall roll forth until it hath filled the whole earth. Okay, just take this now. So because they chose the name kingdom of God for their council, they can now go into the Bible and find anywhere that the phrase kingdom of God is used and say, well, that's talking about us. Yep. I mean, that, that's, that's just, that's the ultimate revisionist. I mean, he's brilliant, first of all, okay, because it takes a brilliant per mind to say, to, to realize that you can do this thing about the name and then suddenly you have this full well to draw on. But how common is the concept of kingdom of God articulated in the Bible? I mean, it's, it's, it's just peppered throughout it. So it's just an infinite well of things for him to draw upon to justify anything that his imagination could come up with. That's all I have to say about that. All right, next. Initially, Latter-day Saints likely understood these statements about the kingdom of God as describing the work of the church. By the time of the organization of the Council of Fifty, Joseph Smith and others saw them as referring to a literal kingdom of God on earth. <laughs> Joseph Smith had been... There's that literal there you kingdom go. you were talking about. There it is. ...publicly expressing similar thoughts on the merits of a theocracy since 1842. When an editor... I'd like to wonder about the merits of a theocracy wherein I'm at the top. Let's see. <laughs> Let's, uh, women? Yeah, I could do that. Money? Yes unaccountable power wherein I can do whatever I want in the name of God and, and anyone who opposes me I can reject as though God were rejecting him? Yes. Ah. The government of God appeared in the Times and Seasons, the Nauvoo newspaper. The editorial written by John Taylor criticized contemporary governments for their failure to promote universal peace and happiness, including the United States government. Speaking about the government of God as reflected in ancient Israel, and in the future millennium, the editorial said their government was a theocracy. They had God to make their laws and men chosen by him to administer them. So will it be when the purposes of God shall be accomplished, when the Lord shall be king over the whole earth and Jerusalem his throne. Members yeah, of the council believe know, that it would... and David worked out so well. <laughs> I, I just, I, I can't believe you read that with a straight face. Yeah. That Samson guy was a top-notch guy. I, I mean, a, speaking as if it's actual his, you know, history, it's, it's, uh, that's another issue entirely. But, you know, Israel isn't really the best place to go to if you want to see how the uh, how theocracy is supposed to operate. There's a very dear leader aspect to this, and, and I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone address the very culty nature of the Council of the Kingdom, because I refuse to call it 50 now. Uh... Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking. If, uh, just just go down the bite model and apply it here. That's all. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've got the same thing. Like you hear the story of in Russia where there was, uh, you know, our dear leader was giving was announced, and everyone started clapping, and nobody wanted to be the first person to stop clapping, and so it went on for like hours and hours, and finally one person decided to stop clapping, which gave permission for everyone else to stop clapping, but that person was later dragged off to the gulag because you don't be the first person to stop doing it. And so it's the same thing. You know, are you going to be the person to vote against Joseph Smith? Well, we know what happens to people who, who, who speak out against him, and it's, it's not good. All right. Play a role in the fulfillment of these biblical and latter-day prophecies. Hiram Smith told the council that the time was at hand when the prophecy should be fulfilled. When the nations were ready to embrace the gospel and when the ensign should be lifted up and the standard and be the standard to the people. 
So how did the church and the council relate to each other in their minds? Though general and local church members were key members of the council, the council was not seen as an ecclesiastical body. The First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, and other church quorums and councils continued to function as normal. And con Except when it came to excommunicating William Law. <laughs> because that was done in those hollowed but not religious council chambers of the Council of the Kingdom of Fifty. As, as well as the Council of Nauvoo, right? There was also the city council... Uh, oh, yeah. Had a lot to say on that matter as well, but it wasn't. It, they were all the same people that were getting the marching orders had already been given here. Yeah, and and, and you know, I think yeah. if I remember right, William Law appealed so, because he said that the procedure was not correct, and so they did a sham uh, excommunication at, at another time. But uh, just this idea that oh, it's totally separate—that's revisionist history that we're now applying in retrospect continued to be responsible for the ecclesiastical matters, such as appointing church officers, disciplining members, teaching doctrine, and performing ordinances. The Council in 50, in contrast, was a temporal or political body created to protect the church and provide its space to flourish. It was an absolute... But, you know... Like, Wait a second. You know, I thought... Be, you know, top of priest and king. That's a spiritual, religious thing. It has nothing to do with, uh, with, with right. any of its political stuff. No, 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 no. I... And he just said it was created to protect the church. What happened to protecting minorities? Minorities, yeah. Yeah. You know, because if you're going to articulate a system of principles of freedom and liberty, you have to be able to protect not just your particular interest group. You have to be able to protect everyone. Wonderful debate in the council where Joseph Smith introduces the topic and he asks, what is the relationship between the church and the council? And the council uh, members debated it, it looks like, all day. And at the end of the debate, this is why. what Joseph says. And they, various people have taken different positions. It says, there is a distinction between the church of God and the kingdom of God. The laws of the kingdom are not designed to affect our salvation hereafter. It is an entire distinct and separate government. The church is a spiritual matter and a spiritual kingdom. But the kingdom which Daniel saw was not a spiritual kingdom, but was designed to be got up for the safety and salvation of the saints by protecting them in their religious rights and worship. So, so basically, he wanted to make sure that he could retain his dominion over the Mormon church, and if he was going to have rule over people who were not Mormons, he would have some separate body in order to assert dominion over them. And he could say, well, you know, this is a separate form of government than the church government, and so now I can also have dominion over the Protestants and the, everyone else. Mm. Okay, so we got a, a couple other things going on here concurrently, right? This is uh, the affidavit of John W. Putnam, and he says uh, that he saw the lodge at Nauvoo and a number of arms, and he understood there were plenty of arms in Nauvoo. He further states that the Mormons are endeavoring to seduce the Indian tribes from their allegiance to the United States and engage them to take up the hatchet against the people of the United States. That adds a little bit of context to uh, uh, kingdoms and setting up and focusing on the other. Uh, and then, uh, unless uh, I'm mistaken, we did have local uh, Native Americans who, uh, I, b I believe there were at least two, who are also on the council at this time. Uh, by August. That was August, so yes. Oh, was that later? Okay, my mistake. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Wilson Law... Um, the brother of, of William Law, so he is a little bit biased. We have to throw that out there. But he does say that Joseph Smith was going to set at defiance for the government, uh, he said, was corrupt and to be overthrown, and he would do it, for he would get help plenty from the Indians, for he had communication with them all the time and were ready. Um, now, is he making up this connection with the Indians? Well, we just had the, our historian talk about how they were talking about the Indians and, and how they were going to go out to them and help them. I'm curious what the minutes actually say when you put that together with him setting up this, again, he just said secular kingdom. This is separate. And that was what Joseph said. Is that this was distinct. How are you going to do that? What's the process? And here we have this Native American um, communication. It just it feels all very, very bad. Just picture, again, Trump, 
Hillary going to, say, Russia uh, to get a whole bunch and asking for help to slander another candidate and or the Second Amendment guys and, and hinting that you can kill the, uh, the other, other candidate and how much of an uproar that was. And you've got this sort of thing going on with Joseph saying, we're going to set up a kingdom. It just blows me away that you can, that this is being portrayed as a calm, just, no, this is no big deal as he's giving the history. I mean, if this was any other religious leader trying to assert this level of political power, including this guy, would just be all over it, saying that that was just, you know, wrong in all sorts of ways. But because he's our special prophet, we tolerate it. Yeah. And why are we always skirting around the issue where the whole point of this is to protect the saints, to protect their rights? And again, I'm getting down to, I'm pretty dang sure that we're mixing up a plural with a singular here, but uh, if we're going to allow that it is to protect the rights of the church, why is he not discussing any of their plans for doing so? You know, how, how, does, the, how does the Council of the Kingdom protect the rights of the members of the church? I suspect it has things to do with, you know, militias and, uh, you know, physical force force of arms and that sort of thing, but that's just me. Mm. Yeah. Not seeing any of that in this discussion at all. Uh, yeah, the, no, the we, only... It's a pact, but we don't know, we aren't told how, it just yeah. is. All right, let's keep going. What did the council do? At a practical level, it had three main accomplishments. First, it managed Joseph Smith's presidential campaign. Second, it provided a forum for making practical decisions in Nauvoo, including Nauvoo. about uh, the Nauvoo Temple and how to protect and govern the city. Uh, extra legal, yeah. secret group for making exactly. practical decisions before the council met. Before well, the city council met. city council, right? Right, exactly. It's like you hear these, you know, these conspiracy theorists, and they say, you know, there's this secret shadow government where there's a group of men that meet in secret, and they predict, and they they're the ones that lay out the plans that the government is going to do, and that's why we already know why the electors have already done. Well, that's exactly what he's saying that the Council of Fifty, Council of the Kingdom, uh, was operating as. It was like yeah. a secret shadow government. All right. After the loss of the Nauvoo Charter after Joseph Smith's death. And third, the council played a major role in, the, in exploring possible settlement sites and in planning the church's migration to the American West. Okay. Under Brigham Young's leadership... I want to point out, none of those are what he's just spent the rest of the time talking about. He mentioned a little bit the exploration, but the rest of it has this whole theocratic, democ- democratic, constitution-forming... It didn't accomplish any of those things, the rest of what he talked about. These are, you know, anyway, whatever. Well, managing Joseph Smith's campaign, what did that involve? That involved saying he was going to run for president and then sending people out and publishing a pamphlet? Yep. I, I don't know. All right. In 1845 and 1846, the council focused less on the wide-ranging discussions about millennial prophecies, the kingdom of God, and constitutionalism that had occupied it during the council's initial months. Just some fun. That is because it was not being led by God, it was being led by a man who had his own particular agenda, his own way of talking about things, his own paradigm for governance, and that man had died. And so, anyway. Things from the presidential campaign. Rather, council members focused on more pragmatic concerns, particularly how to govern the city of Nauvoo after the Illinois legislature revoked the Nauvoo Charter. This meant that the, that the city had no militia, it had no police force, it had no judicial system, it had no city council, and the Council of Fifty steps into that void. Whew, so good thing we had a shadow They also government. continued gathering information on western sites uh, under Brigham Young. During Which was already the settled Brigham at the Rocky Mountains by vision. The council in 1845 and 1846, in the shadow of the murders of Joseph and Hiram Smith, and with a growing realization of the saints' tenuous situation in Nauvoo, council members occasionally lashed out in anger at their perceived enemies. 
Brigham Young expressed his frustration by stating that he did not care about preaching to the Gentiles any longer. Indeed, he stated, paraphrasing, paraphrasing Lyman White, let the scoundrels be killed. Let them be swept off the earth, and then we can go and be baptized for them. Easier than we can convert them. Oh. <laughs> oh, I love it when our prophet talks about the killing of the Gentiles. And, uh, but really, that softer language than you'll find in the Oath of Vengeance that they were all swearing by now in the temple uh, to martyr, to, to avenge the blood of the prophets. So. Well, let's just picture Donald Trump saying that line, though, right? Just, just put it in his voice. It's Actually, it's not life. that surprising for Donald Trump. No, it's right there. <laughs> it would be easier. It would be easier. Just kill him. Yeah. We baptize him after. Done. Yeah. Wow. Now I want to see someone mash up a bunch of Brigham Young with Donald Trump. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've been secretly. This is a, a, a personal. I, I, every time he speaks, I just, I just apply a Brigham Young quote to it, and it entertains me way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm personally a fan of the Zap Brannigan as Donald Trump <laughs> memes. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. No Let's offense get... to people who support either candidate and or in any party. I'm just saying, when you put it in context with what was going on then to now, you, you get a very different view. Okay. All right. Mm. Let's keep going. The previous treatment of the Latter-day Saints in Missouri and Illinois and the murders of the Smiths heavily influenced his rhetoric. The Gentiles have rejected the gospel. They have killed the prophets. And those who have not taken an active part in the murder all rejoice in it and say amen to it. Rather than preach to the gospel, he continued, the saints would look to the house of Israel, by which he meant the American Indians. He thought the American remember, governments had been too powerless. Joseph's talking about allying with those Indians to use the hatchet. And Brigham's talking about killing the Gentiles and looking to the house of Israel. There's a little more context than he's letting on. <laughs> it's all metaphor. It's all metaphor. <laughs> Corrupt to protect the Latter-day Saints' rights. And he vowed that he would not allow himself to be killed and taken as Joseph had been. Both the Latter-day Saints and their opponents accepted widespread American attitudes toward community violence and vigilantism that justified using extra-legal means to provide for community defense when other mechanisms failed or to enforce order on individuals or communities perceived as unstable. It's in that context and in the context of the, of the revoking of the Nauvoo Charter and there's no police force in Nauvoo that Brigham Young encourages uh, the formation of the Whistling and Whittling Brigades. Bands of Deacon it's meant to patrol the city and make sure uh, and to intimidate uh, outsiders who they thought might be causing trouble in the city. Of Deacon, course, if these are lovable 12-year-olds with pocket knives, that's one image. If they're 20-year-olds with buoy knives, that's another image. Oh, yeah, that. The Mormons themselves continue to be targets of extra... He didn't mention that it was not just outsiders, but it was also any dissenters. Anyway, let's keep going. Extra yeah, legal vigilantes... Yeah. Hmm? We do need to mention that William Law was actually run out by the Whistling and Whittling Brigade, as well as anyone suspected of, uh, of being a party to uh, anything that William Law did. So this is, we talked a lot early on about the... Um, was it William Smith happen. also? Yeah, yeah, the prophet's brother uh, who... who suggested someone else should be prophet other than Brigham. So this theocratic democracy, if you it's basically you get either killed and or driven out at knife point if you disagree. That's the the enactment of uh of the principles because they're so scared. And I think we do need to say that. They are legitimately scared that they are going to lose everything again. Um and so they're willing to turn on anyone. It's like the internment camps for the Japanese, too. It's like the, the KKK who, who turn on uh, the perceived threat from, from the Negro or the black person, the African-American, however you want to say the, what was in context at the time. They are taking their anger out on anyone, and they're very suspicious. And I say that because any sort of system that gets to this sort of heavy theocratic nature, as soon as they feel any sort of perceived threat, it turns on the minority really fast. Yeah. 
All right, let's keep up. After the mob murders of the Smiths, and the saints uh, themselves expelled some dissenters from Nauvoo uh, as well. Notwithstanding... Some. By the way, you know... How just, many yeah. dissenters were... Footnote. What, what percent? <laughs> some. some. We let some of the dissenters stay, and we kicked the rest out. Yeah. The often heated statements within the Council of Fifty, Mormon extralegal violence was typically limited to the defense of Nauvoo from outsiders oh, okay. and uh, the expulsion of dissidents from the city. When faced with the possibility of armed conflict between the saints and other Illinois residents, Young and other church leaders spoke of suffering wrong rather than doing wrong and eventually opted for a mass exodus rather than battle. Which happened okay. to be initiated when there was a federal indictment for counterfeiting, which named Brigham Young and several of his counselors and uh, a counterfeiting ring. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, because the Mormon battle, I mean, there was a battle of Nauvoo, first of all, so they did do a battle. Let's, let's not glaze over that. But that was only after almost all of them were gone and people were coming in to take the abandoned houses. Although, interestingly... Uh, Emma and Martin Harris, uh, neither of them had the fight in the Battle of Nauvoo. They just, they just, they stayed behind, right? And they kept their houses. Anyway, the point is <laughs> that this is a real skew of history uh, to say that that either they tried not to battle or that I mean they ran because, like you said, federal indictments. It wasn't over like some sort of giant mob. Oh, they had an army, one third the size of the United States. They didn't. There was no. It wasn't like that, guys. Come on. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, what about the Council of 50 Minutes today? They're, of course, of interest to historians. They provide us terrific cool. detail in what's often a lost period of Latter-day Saint history between the martyrdom and the Trek West. But I think there's also some things in here that will be wait, wait, more... Wait, but, but the Council of Fifty continued long after, right? We already he mentioned during the Brigham period... Well, yeah, but he's I saying mean, this is where we get a lot of information about what happened in that gap. Yeah, Absolutely, but let's not gloss over that, in fact, the Council of Fifty went for a long time afterwards and set up the church as we know it today. I just, okay, not going here, to be here's publishing a... Those. Here's a question, though. Okay, so the Council of Fifty was set up with the most extreme form of secrecy that they could envision at the time. Now, yep. if there was a Council of Fifty today, we are not know. supposed to know about it. So, like, like if you were to ask a Mormon at that time, hey, do you guys uh, have a secret shadow government? They'd say, like, no, that's, you know, no, not at all. We don't have anything like that. And, and so it's kind of like, well, since that's in the church's history, how, and, and it was apparently sanctioned by the prophet, how do we know that that's not going on today? Because nobody would know about it. Google Ensign Peak Advisors. <laughs> it's a secret. No, uh, there was a... So just to, to play to, to a little bit to conspiracy theory, we're all going to put on a tinfoil hat for a second. When Mitt Romney ran, because he does mention the running of Mitt Romney while talking about the Council of Fifty, why not? Uh, there was a secret organization that sprung up called the Ensign Peak Advisors that all the money was funneled through for his campaign. Uh, that was con contributed through, you know, giant amounts of Utah dollars um, that suddenly doesn't exist anymore, or at least, you know, and it the address of it is downtown, owned by the church. Um, yeah, no, it could still be a thing, or there could be a spinoff, and maybe they don't call it the Council of Fifty, they call it something else, but uh, as long as we're going to go there, uh, no, there's still shadow things that get set up and fall apart, and who knows? What? I mean, I just the, the fact that you're... That Oh. Go ahead, Tom. I would make the argument that there should be, right? But like we've been saying before, this, this thing matters. This is supposed to be the way things are going to be afterwards. Um, there should there should be. We should expect You're right. that the top 15, it, it, it should be enough. It mattered back then. It should matter now. Either it's if true Christ, or it isn't, right? It should have right. been or it what shouldn't be. If Christ needed that council to be in place in preparation for his return then, he still needs it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if it has been disbanded, you know, then there, there should be some sort of, well, we, we don't really have a lot of revelations for that sort of thing, but it seems like the sort of thing that would de demand some sort of uh, 
action to yeah. have been taken that we should well, have some record of, right? So. And that's the missing thing from this guy's talk. He doesn't have a section of titled, Why Did the Church Keep These Minutes Secret? Like, that's the section that should be in this talk. But it's not. All right. Wide interest. The Council of 50 Minutes provide a way of studying how church members can make decisions according to inspiration in the council process. While the council chairman, Joseph Smith of Brigham Young, directed some council discussions, the members had equal opportunity to speak. Council decisions were to be unanimous. Council members... Okay, again, just to reinforce, if council decisions have to be unanimous, that's not a democracy. That, that's just, that's flat out, you're just a rubber stamp, veneer, parlamentary for show of reflecting the will of the autocrat. Well, well, they had an obligation. And he is, uh, a regular member is going to hear that it sounds just like what they've been told, the way the Quorum of the Twelve works. And they're, they're just going to say, oh, that's, that's just the way church councils work. We don't do anything unless it's uh, unanimous. It makes for a conservative, uh, risk, you know, low risk no. situation. And, and that, that's a good thing. I support that. No. no, the problem, the problem is if, if the vote is not unanimous, then the people who disagree mm -hmm. are kicked out of the, the group, and that's, right. that's a problem. Offer candid commentary on issues before the council, and that their, their collective deliberations would lead them to correct and inspire decisions. <laughs> well, I did disagree with this until I heard that persuasive argument, and, and now I conform. <laughs> From the beginning of the council, Joseph Smith urged participants to speak their minds, to say what was in their hearts, whether good or bad. He you see, I just I imagine these conversations going like, well, I think Joseph Smith should be our prophet. Well, I disagree with you. I think he should be our prophet and priest. Well, I disagree. <laughs> I think he should be our prophet, priest, and king, and I move that he be our prophet, priest, and king. And, and so it's like, you know, the type of disagreements can be like, right. you know, you're not being subservient and laudatory enough towards the prophet. And, and this is just me projecting what happens in other hierarchy, autocratic organizations. But uh, anyway. and, uh, Well, I should be taking the point of view of a Hanlon, Hanlon's razor, which is uh, don't, don't look for malice where stupidity will do. But uh, if I wanted to look at this in a certain way, I, I could certainly say that, uh, uh, oh, crap. This is why I didn't, didn't want to do it live. My brain just farted. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to jump in and save, save you, yeah, give you some time to think of it. But the, uh, uh, except for William Law, right? William Law got up and said, we have a problem. Uh, and he spoke his mind. And I think that it, there's actually, he has a point, and that we shouldn't rag on him too hard, because William Law felt like he could speak out and, and be vocal and be heard and we have that on record, both in the, the Nauvoo Council, and I've, I'm going to guess here in the minutes when they release them and we can all read them, that he's going to come forward and really say there's a problem. Uh, oh, and then we'll see second. what happens. Oh, hold up. Was William Law in the Council of 50? Was he not? I don't think so. Well, I don't know. I believe he was. Let's check the list really quick. Well, no, it, it, started uh, in, it started in March. Yeah, he was out. William yeah. Law was not in the Council <laughs> of 50. <laughs> I swear. No. Oh. But the, the, the thing that I just wanted to say was... Okay, so maybe... Uh, yeah, I don't know what any disagreements were, but I was thinking... You no, know, it was... All, <laughs> no. all back. Well, William Law spoke out because the, the council was leaky. You know, despite the mm -hmm. oath of secrecy, yeah. people were... And, and I, if I we're recall concerned. correctly, the minutes are going to show that in some meetings they're complaining about the fact that people know about what went on. And that's why the Nauvoo Expositor has that information about the prophet, priest, and king. I see. All right. There you go. Let's Never going. mind. I don't know of anyone who ever disagreed. And he did not want to be served. Oh, 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 that's a good question. Well, for the Council of 50, it'll, that's where the minutes will be elucidative, is you know, yeah, did exactly. anyone disagree yeah. and how was the conflict resolved? Right. And, but even beyond that, outside of the Council of 50... Um, People who disagreed with Joseph didn't fare well. You know, there were some women uh, who stood up to him, but if they ever uh, were verbal about his proposals uh, and and disclosed what he was doing, he 
either initiated or tolerated people disparaging their character. Yeah. And you can read all about that on thoughtsandthingsandstuff.com. All right. Founded forever by a set of dough heads, by which he meant, I think, yes men. And if they did not rise up and shake themselves and exercise themselves in discussing these important matters, he should consider them nothing better than dough heads. Can, can we just say this deliberate a unanimous process. vote, a unanimous vote where everyone goes through and says yes, 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 is the definition of yes men. <laughs> I'm sick of all these yes men around me. Well, I'd like to, to disagree with you. You're out! <laughs> He just wants to make sure that all sorts of ideas that come up, that there's a flourishing of, of, of culture, to, to just like uh, Chairman Mao what, wanted for, for his yes. country, you know? Just bring up everything you have, and, and, and I'm sure it'll be important that we all know that you have these ideas. You know, they do hold elections in North Korea, and they also are unanimous. That's right. That's that was followed. As the council explored possible new settlement sites for the saints, Here's what the map looks like in uh, February 1844 as the council has its beginnings. Sometimes Latter-day Saints assumed that the Saints knew they were headed to the Rocky Mountains uh, earlier than, than they were. So first of all, the yeah. Wisconsin Saints all say maybe we should go down to Texas. About it. Well, there you go. You told us about that. Yeah, I do like this map. Joseph Smith. I do like and that. others begin planning expeditions to Oregon and California. Then the council is organized. Let's see what happens under Joseph Smith. So you remember, Oregon is disputed between U.S. and Britain. Britain. Upper California is Mexican territory, and the Republic of Texas is independent. So one of the first things the council does is send a delegate to Texas. He meets with Sam Houston and explores Mormon colonization of Texas. They send delegates to Washington, D.C. to see about the possibility of, of, of raising uh, men to protect the western frontier. Okay, I just want <laughs> to... I, I had a chance to try to track that letter down, and they have it scanned on the church mm -hmm. website. And Joseph Smith lays out all the persecutions that they've undergone and the prior attempts to get uh, recompense from the government. And then he says... You know, he, he gives them some resolutions and says, I need you guys to, the Congress, to agree to this. It's basically, we need to be able to draw up men in the army. We need to be able to have the army sent out to protect our interests. And when they do that, then the Nauvoo Legion needs to be able to operate under the laws and pay of the army. Now, Joseph Smith is a lieutenant general in the Nauvoo right. Legion, which is the equivalent of a three-star general, which would have been almost, if not the highest ranking military person in the U.S. military at that time. And so he basically tried to make it so that he would personally personally command, uh, uh, and, and I'm trying to find the documentation, there's references to him requesting 100,000 men uh, to be able and to come to aid. Now the population of Illinois in that year was just around 400,000. So he was basically asking for what was the equivalent of 25% of the population of the state to be in the military that he would then command. Now, if you want to know how that would play out if he'd gotten them, there's a chapter in the Book of Mormon about a guy named Amalekiah. And he, you know, <laughs> perhaps the military, blah, 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 blah. All right. Let us continue. The council approved plans for the Wisconsin Saints to settle in the Republic of Texas, a commission that Lyman White never forgot. Then Joseph and his brothers were killed. What There's happens in the There's so much of a story there that he just ignored. Same map. The council is reorganized February 4th. The council considers various settlements, Oregon, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, or possibly among Cherokee or other Indians in the West. Then they begin to zero in on Upper California. Why? Because in March 1845, the, Re the Republic of Texas becomes the state of Texas. Can't go there because then those pesky laws will apply to us. When it becomes so, they still are looking outside the boundaries of the United States. So they begin to focus their attention on the Upper California. 
really quickly, just imagine that we get either emails from Hillary or Trump tweets. I'm looking at extradition or non-extradition places to run my campaign from. Just, just picture it for a minute. <laughs> it just, ah, mind blowing. Go on. They also send missionaries to American Indian tribes to check out possibilities there. John Taylor writes this wonderful song that is first sung, perhaps even written, during the meeting of the Council of Fifty. The Upper California, oh, that's the land for me. It lays between the mountains and the great Pacific Sea. The saints can be supported there and enjoy sweet liberty. With flocks and herds abounding, oh, that's the land for me. Tom? But hold you on, need John. The congregations in California to pick up that song again. <laughs> I, th I think that would be great. How can we make that happen? Uh, I do it, puppets. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they begin. They continue studying the maps, meeting with fur traders and others, uh, and they begin to receive reports about the Rocky Mountains and specifically about the Great Salt Lake. Jim Brigham Bridger. announces his intention to settle near the Great Salt Lake. What's that? Jim Bridger and the, 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 all the mountain men that we have to study here as part of Utah history, they came back and, and reported, and their reports were published, and hence they thought Rocky Mountains, which is the anti-Mormon argument because the pro-Mormon argument is that whole Rocky Mountain barrel thing. It just it all plays together, and it's really interesting to have it here in a fair conference again. This is uh, probably a good 15 papers at FAIR uh, on their website that you can just toss all their references out because it's very clear that they were not settled on the Great Salt Lake at, until this point, hmm. until yeah. after this point. Lake, and the council begins preparations for a mass exodus from Nauvoo. And interestingly, it's only at the end of that deliberative process, after they've explored every possibility, after they've looked at every map, after they've talked with everyone they can who knows about the West, after they've sent delegates here and there and everywhere, it's only then that Brigham Young receives a revelation of confirmation. And he says in the Council of Fifty, the saying of the prophets would never be verified unless the house of the Lord should be reared in the tops of the mountains and the proud banner of liberty wave over the valleys that are within the mountains. And I know where the spot is, and I know how to make the flag. So let's, One other let's reason that I think that... Consider really quickly what he has said, because it's, it's small and yet it's huge. Going to the Rocky Mountains was not Joseph Smith's revelation. It was Brigham's. And he's playing with this whole, we studied it out in our minds first, and then we prayed and confirmed the location sort of, of rhetoric that would feel good to a, a saint. But there should be a little bit of a disturbing note to, to any member that really they were considering, I mean, one of the things they were studying out in their minds was, where can we get away from the laws of the United States and get away from this horrible United States Constitution that Nephi talks about as being inspired in the, in the Book of Mormon in order to set up a theocracy to control people and, and, uh, and at the same time, okay, this, this January 19, 1846, the uh, Quorum of the Twelve has voted that they don't have to pay tithing anymore, but everyone else has to. That whole thing should just churn in stomachs. Um, it's just, it's very awkward and, and surreal, but he's couching it in, oh no, they just studied out in their minds and then prayed about it. I also find it interesting that we're uh, in the Joseph Smith Papers project, but uh, yep. at this point now we've kind of moved beyond this, uh, and I, I, I appreciate it, and I, I understand why, it, why it's here, it's just, it's making the, the end point for the release of these papers seeming more and more arbitrary to me, that we're going to stop it before we get to Utah. Whereas the council continues for, as we, as we're going to kind of cover just a little bit, just for kind of wrapping things up, um, the council continues all the way up until at least the 1880s, on and off again, but we're not going to get those minutes. They're, they're, I, as far as I know, they're not planned, um, because we don't have a Brigham Young Papers project, and I should probably shut up about that.
never going to happen. I would love to see a Brigham Young Papers project. That would Stop be very fascinating. Young Papers project happen. It isn't going to happen. We all know why it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> Let's continue. The council minutes will be of interest, and then they go last. We know that part. Is that there's just some terrific statements from Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and, and others in the Council of 50 that we've never had before. Let me just read two of these to you. This is Brigham. He supposed there has not yet been a perfect revelation given, because we cannot understand it, yet we receive a little here and a little there. He should not be stumbled if the prophet should translate the Bible 40,000 times over. And yet it should be different in some places every time. Because when God speaks, he always speaks according to the capacity of the people. The starting point for the government of the kingdom is in the book of Doctrine and Covenants. But he does not know how much more there is in the bosom of the Almighty. When God sees that his people have enlarged upon what he has given us, he will give us more. So moral relativism. God uh, yeah. is morally relativistic. Uh, what it. might be right in one circumstance or what might be forbidden in one circumstance is okay in another as long as God commands it. Oh, and I'm the one who tells you what God commands. And uh, yeah. the thing is, that same concept is employed by any religious charlatan. And uh, and you look at it and you're like, you're you're exploiting religious authority in order to exert your own will upon your, you know, your dupes. But when Joseph Smith does it, or when you hear it in the somber tones of Brigham Young, then it's okay. And we began this, you, you said, that, you know, he began it with the, the relativistic, this was a different era, and we all know the speaking as a man, or J Brigham was a, was a product of his time. That concept combined with this one is terrifying. Yeah. yeah. He's a man. He speaks as a man. He's going to have his own wishes, but you're going to have to obey him as though he were God. Well, and the other thing is, what he's doing here is he's providing a framework for people who have detected contradictions in the proclamations of Joseph, in the revelations, who have detected changes, internal contradictions in the in his translations of the Bible, and he's giving them a framework to excuse that. And, and like all good, you know, coercive groups. It's not, oh, the leader was mistaken. It's, oh, you, the members, were not ready to hear this before. And so it's because you didn't, you know, you weren't ready, so the fault is on you. Okay. So Tom, let's keep going you, with this. We're getting wait, 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 Tom. I need, I, need, I need him to jump in. Can you tell me any Greek in the translation of the Bible that Joseph Smith did that, that makes sense in this context where, like, the retranslation was because the people weren't ready for one bit of Greek versus a different oh, bit of Greek. Yeah, no, uh, and to be honest, the, the the entire idea that the modern church likes to talk about of restoring, like the original holograms or any ho holographs or anything like that, it, it is you can show that that just doesn't work. He's working with an English Bible. I find it interesting that the example that Brigham Young gives of translating the Bible like forty thousand times over, Joseph translated at least two different sections of the New Testament. Twice without knowing it, and they both end up different each time. But yeah, you knew the problems already. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I suspect someone pointed it out. But uh, you can find that if you Google the twice translated scriptures, there's an article that shows you that on uh, thoughtsandthingsandstuff.com. All right, let's keep going. This is a long one and probably unreadable for you, but let me read it. I'll read portions of it. He says, this is Joseph Smith on religious liberty. He argues that the agency that God gave his children requires mortals, two, to grant and safeguard the freedom of religion. He declares, God cannot save or damn a man only on the principle that every man acts, chooses, and worships for himself. Hence, the importance of thrusting from us every spirit of bigotry and intolerance towards a man's religious sentiments that spirit which has drenched the earth in blood. When a man feels the least temptation to such intolerance, he ought to spurn it from him. You know, what really gets me is that I've interacted with a lot of um, 
much more progressive religious congregations, and there are religions which feel very sincerely and devoutly that tolerance for gay and LGBT people is part of their spiritual creed because it's a manifestation of the injunction for love that they feel a call on their own hearts on. And so the fact that they're using the phrase bigotry and everything in terms of religion and then seeing how the church operates today, even he, he's using this phrase from the, the Menets because it's Joseph Smith in his great oratorial mode, um, making grand proclamations of, of very elevated sentiments but when you look at the, how it actually is played out in the history of the church and in the modern history of the church, it, this is just empty rhetoric. I, we also mentioned the, the word it minorities. Our, yeah. Yeah. Ne Beauty. Never is in... On a, sorry, the use of the word minorities okay. is never in conjunction with what we would consider today to be minorities. Granted, it was a different time period, but the treatment of minorities is, a, is an issue, isn't it? Well, the only minority that mattered was the Mormon minority, not the black minority, not, not anything else. To this intolerance and corruption, the inalienable right of man being to think as he pleases, worship as he pleases, this being the first law of everything that is sacred, to guard every ground all the days of our lives. I will appeal to every man in this council, beginning at the youngest, that when he arrives to the years of old age, he will have to say that the principles of intolerance and bigotry never had a place in this kingdom nor in my breast. And that... Unless you publish a paper that exposes me and then I'll intolerate the heck out of you. He is even then ready to die rather than yield to such things. Nothing... Mm, no, I'm pretty sure he tried to run, but to his credit he did go back and die. Reclaim the human mind from its ignorance, bigotry, superstition, etc., but those grand and sublime principles of equal rights and universal freedom to all men. Amen. When I have yes, used <laughs> every means in my power to exalt a man's mind and have taught him righteous principles to no effect, he is still inclined in his darkness. Yet the same principles of liberty and charity would ever be manifested by me as though he embraced it. Hence, in all governments or political transactions, a man's religious opinion should never be called in question. Wait, so Joseph Smith just said that if he teaches a person all of these great, grand things, but that person never accepted them and acted on them, he would still act with the greatest compassion and charity towards that person, as though he had embraced it. It's utter hypocrisy, complete empty rhetoric. I mean, the guy could talk. He could he could turn a phrase, but he had the it's words. Not there. He had the best words. Yeah. I oh, I will. I honestly I will put Joseph Smith up against Donald Trump as an orator, and oh. Donald Trump would have nothing on him. Absolutely agreed. Man hey, should be judged talk. by the law. He had a good memory. Independent. Yeah. All right, let's get going. A religious prejudice. I'll let Joseph have the last word. Coming All right, this has been long. Yeah. He, he does t field a few questions. Uh, how much longer do we have? We have uh, about ten minutes left. Should we uh, push through the questions? I haven't seen the questions yet, so this will actually be off the cuff. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Scott mentioned that it's only lunch afterwards, so we can take as long as we want questions and answers. And... Did Joseph Smith not understand the Council of Twelve through the Council of Fifty? Um, I'm not sure I totally grasped the question. Uh, he saw them as two independent bodies. All of the twelve joined the Council of Fifty, uh, and um, so he, he doesn't see the count. He sees them as operating, I think, really within different realms: the Council of Fifty in the realm of politics and government, and the, the Quorum of the Twelve in the realm of ecclesiastical matters. Our mission. No, no, How many no, names no, no, on the no, list? No. <laughs> Except when we excommunicate William. So William Law wasn't part of the Twelve. He was one of the first two presidency. And, and the Council of the Twelve, right, they, they were out like uh, 
they were well. They weren't just missionaries. They were doing um, campaign. They were campaigning for him. So they were not separate at all. This they were sent out as part of the the mission of this to to campaign for his presidency. Well, I, I think part of what he's trying to say though is that they have different purposes, and that the twelve are apostles. And, uh, the twelve were salesmen at this point. I don't yeah. think that there's a. Uh, they they well, were out selling like, the church and they were out selling the campaign. It's kind of like the railroad board and the sugar, the beet sugar company board. You know, the apostles are all on those boards, but those boards deal with different industries. <laughs> all right. The fifty left the church, and how many were enemies to the church? It's a great question. Um, you know, I'm not totally sure. By the time of the Joseph Smith era, they're kind of fudging, and there's 54 members of the council. Uh, one of the first actions they do under Brigham Young is to drop 22 members of the council. Uh, they drop Sidney Rigdon and people who followed Rigdon. Uh, they drop the three non-members. Uh, Brigham knew how to consolidate power. <laughs> Very to everything that you said up to this point about you know exactly what's going to happen, that was just, just justified all of it. I had not seen that before. And there you go. First thing you do, drop the non-members. Second thing, drop everyone who followed Sydney. Third thing, you know, Council of 50, why call it that? It's the Council it's of the, the Kingdom, and we need to be honest of about it. Council of 50-ish, you know. Eh. Uh, reasons, they don't see them as trustworthy anymore. They drop others who have come out, out in opposition to the church. So there but is a the significant Joseph group of that I original men. That they were all, you know, upstanding, honest people, right? That's, that's what we talked about before. These, these, they're untrustworthy. That's, that's just such a surprise. Yeah. And, and it was a minority at this point, and it, they wanted to protect those minorities so dearly all along that... Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he didn't want to be surrounded by dough heads, you know. He wanted people who weren't just yes-men, but as soon as they weren't yes-men... Uh, original 50, uh, who are dropped at the beginning of the Brigham Young year of the council. Other men are then added uh, to the council, so that always has roughly around 50 men. Why are there 54 members listed in the Council of 50? Well, they just, you know, you, there's some new people who should be admitted, and what can you do? Uh, th there's a little bit of confusion sometimes in the records whether the standing chairman and the clerk uh, should be counted as uh, in the list of 50 or not, but they saw 50 as kind of a rough guide, not, a, not an exact number. Yeah, so, so there's a question here, were there other besides LDS in the original 50? There are these three non-Mormons. Uh, they're not exactly the most distinguished uh, people you would ever uh, meet in your life. To say uh, the least. But, but they're people who have shown some friendliness uh, to, to the Mormons in Nauvoo. And they don't really play that active of a role in the council. And I, I think uh, Joseph sees their role almost as symbolic, as saying, in the kingdom of God, oh. it's not just Mormons. I bet we're the token minorities. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't we don't let just Mormons in here. We also got the counterfeiters, the arms dealers. You know, we're we're equal opportunities. <laughs> so we're the whistlers and withers, twelve year olds with pocket knives, or twenty year olds with Bowie knives. Well, th this was an era in which deacons were generally men in their twenties and thirties. Ah. These are not twelve year olds, uh, notwithstanding what you may have read in the friend over time. Uh, I love it when the church misrepresents history. It's so humorous. There's a note there. I was actually taught about this as a teacher and, and encouraged to have my pocket knife with me on scout camps because of this. So, yeah, it's funny and all until they actually taught it as doctrine. <laughs> it changed my life. Yeah. I, but I have a good pocket it's, knife. It's, it. uh, these are grown men. Are the minutes... Images available online. Uh, they will be. Uh, so uh, uh, probably within about a year of the publication of the book. So next fall, we'll put the minutes uh, images online. That's a big one. You know, if, if there were to be any, uh, you know, if they were discussing anything from the temple, I, I, I would be interested to see if they are going to be doing any sort of editing or obfuscation of any kind or, or not. Yeah, I'd be surprised if they talk about the temple with non-Mormons there and with it being the temple, the 
that group I, at this time was still fairly secretive as, as far as well, I know. But but after, after February, uh, after Brigham Young's takeover, things might oh, have been a true. bit more free. Yeah. I don't know. You, you never know with Joseph as well. I mean, we have this kind of idea that it was all secret and it was all... But he talked about a lot of things with a lot of people in a lot of weird ways. You just never know. <laughs> True. All right. Let's see. How are we doing, Scott? Do the minutes add insights to the challenges of the women of Nauvoo? I wonder about Emma Smith and her role or lack thereof after the killing uh, of Joseph Smith. You know, there, there just really isn't much in the minutes that would uh, add to our knowledge uh, of Emma Smith. Certainly you, you see some of the fallout that happens uh, afterwards uh, in, in uh, the minutes. Um, but uh, Emma Smith is mentioned one time in the minutes, and she's actually the only woman mentioned uh, in the minutes. So the, those looking for insights and that question, um, we, we always have trouble including uh, a lot of women in the Joseph Smith papers because of the nature of the documents, and this volume is particularly bad that way. Does the council meet again? <laughs> women, if you want to know your place in the kingdom, it's just been told to you right there. It can't be much clearer than that. It's so funny is that, you know, he alluded to earlier about this great editorial where it's like, you know, we want to promote the happiness of people and, and all, all the only governments that have ever done it have been theocracies and that's what we want to go for. And if you look at the plight of, of the Mormon woman under the boot of polygamy and, and just all of the suffering that went on in the past and continues to go on in the, under the shadow of the FLDS now, that's not happiness. That's just terrible. All right. After January 1846. Yes, uh, so the council meets at winter quarters on a handful of occasions. They then meet uh, in Salt Lake uh, between about 1848 and 1851, 1848, 1849. The council in a lot of ways is acting as the governmental body uh, in Salt Lake. This is before the organization of the territory. There's a very kind of small revival of the council in 1867. They just kind of convene and add a few members. Uh, then in, the 18, in 1880, John Taylor, who of course is a very active member of the council uh, with Joseph Smith, reconvenes the council and it operates from about 1880 uh, to 1885. Uh, the council uh, then uh, doesn't meet uh, again uh, in its history. Uh, how are the Joseph Smith papers? And and so he's clearly read all of those minutes. Is he going to let us all be privy to them? Made a positive influence to our understanding of uh, church history. Uh, you know, I I, I think there's lots of ways. I think I think we understand that the Joe Smith papers are not going to be read uh, by the vast uh, majority of church members. They're kind of big. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, it was made very clear to the Joe Smith paper staff early on that the, that the vision of the papers was to be written to scholars, that the audience was academics, so that books, so that it would, they, they would have credibility uh, to academics around the world. And we think we've achieved that. Uh, but we're also interested in having the books influence understanding of church history to, to average members. And so we do try to work uh, 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 in various ways to uh, have that happen. Uh, uh, with other people in the church history department, we've written a series of articles called Revelations in Context that give the story, the backstory of each section of the Doctrine and Covenants using insights from the Joseph Smith Papers. Uh, insights from the Joe Smith Papers were also integrated into the section headings of the Doctrine and Covenants in 2013, and we've tried to work with our, our friends in, in, in the curriculum department and, and, and seminaries and institutes uh, so that they have the best historical information uh, to work with as well. 50% of the Kingdom of God or of any kingdom are women. Is there any indication that the Council of 50 had any intention of having women serve and the government of the proposed theodemocracy? Uh, you know, I think it's just a question that, that they didn't consider. Uh, I think we're just, they're just in a different era, and that, that question, as far as I know, doesn't come up, uh, certainly doesn't. I'm pretty sure God, who was directing 
the prophet directing the council didn't care about women back then. That's why it's not, you know, yeah, that's no, the only he's, reason. He's unchanging, so, you know. We're probably going out of out of step now to pay all this attention to the rights of women and the plight, the plight of women. Yeah, we, we, we had gotten approval of the council. Yeah, he said that they were a constitution. They they had they they set out to make a perfect constitution, and God said, "You've already got one." No women yeah. in there. Yeah, it's, and there's no indication that it comes up uh, in their thoughts for what the Council of Fifty is at that moment. Wow. It's honest. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I agree with them. I, I'm not surprised. So yeah, it it, it is part of the, the culture. So. Although we had some really strong women at the time, it's kind of a shame. Okay. Right. Eliza R. Snow, for goodness' sake. Yeah. Basically, anybody who was involved in that thing that they had a few months before that. Is there what? Lots of problems, I guess. Uh, maybe I can understand now why there weren't any women involved. Hmm. <laughs> I, I didn't hear you. No, I, I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> so the question was, is there a secret council of 50 now? Really? I didn't hear it. I certainly I wouldn't know if there was a secret member of the council. <laughs> no, I mean, I, the, there's no indication that the council operated after 1885. I want to point out the humor. Can we point out the humor? The things that he has laughed at have been... Um, Slaughtering Gentiles, uh, people not understanding or knowing, the governor being erroneous in in his hearing of rumors that were pretty much confirmed by almost everything he said, and and uh, hidden secret things that the rest of us don't know about. I mean, the apologist humor is really offensive if you just take it on its own for what it is. Stop or, laughing that the rest of us don't know what you know. Okay? Just the benefit of the doubt. be honest. I think it's, a lot of it is very nervous laughter. Yeah, I agree. Sure. I think it yeah, shows. Yeah. It's like, gosh, I can really understand why they think that this is totally corrupt. <laughs> 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 All right, yeah. let's keep You got to laugh or you got to uh, cry, so, as they say. Um, one question, can you tell us a little bit about the three non-members who are on the Council of 50, how they feel about being part of it? You know, there's no actual records left from these three men that would comment on their uh, participation with the Council. What is okay. the most interesting thing you discovered uh, while writing the Council of 50 Minutes? I'll just say that for me as a historian, working with the Council of 50 Minutes was terrific. There's very few opportunities to be able I, I haven't heard what he's going to say, but I just hope it's not like I was inspired by what a great uh, govern, government maker Joseph was, or, or something you know that's basically lauding Joseph. I, hopefully, it's something more than that. To look at a record and work on a record that hasn't been looked at before and hasn't been worked on uh, before, and I think for me. Um, so some of what I've, I've highlighted here is what I, what I really enjoyed. I, these discussions that they have in the council in April 1844, uh, the way they organize the council is they all sit in a semicircle. No, so, sorry, they sit in a circle, Joseph at the head, the oldest member of the council to his immediate right, and so on around the circle. And the idea is that every man will have the chance to speak in the council. So, for instance, when Joseph raises the question, is there a distinction between the church of God and the kingdom of God, he turns to his right and Samuel Bent, the oldest man in the council, is supposed to speak first. So imagine war council with 50 people in the room, and everyone's supposed to go around the circle and say something, right? These meetings are all-day meetings, and William Clayton just kept terrific minutes. So you just have such a window onto what they were thinking, what they thought about the U.S. Constitution, what they thought about uh, a, a divine constitution. What just all these kind of theoretical the debates they're having were really interesting. It was fascinating to me that Joseph lets them all speak, kind of getting wisdom from the group, and then at the end he explains, "This is how I see it." Uh, and, 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 and so that was um, really uh, interesting to me. I will mention, Can this I is how out? I see it, and now you all agree with me, or you're out. So a circle does not actually have a head, and I, I think we could do a whole post on. Uh, the head of the circle. Uh, he got the first word. It went to the oldest person 
around the circle and he got the last word. And that right there is theocratic democracy in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I, I'm opposed to the association of the word democracy with theodemocracy. I think it's, it's an insult. <laughs> nope. And um, anyway, let's keep going. Um, yeah, no. I brought a number of these pamphlets. There's about 50 sitting. Uh, they were at the auction table, but they've probably been moved. But they're back there. We'll find them. Uh, th this highlights what we've done with the Church Historians Press this year. It has the first uh, minutes of the Council of 50 that have been available. So there's a minute uh, day's discussion in here. There's also uh, excerpts from the first 50 years of Relief Society from Joseph Papers, Documents 4, which uh, the excerpt is about the calling of the original 12. And then there's uh, journal. Uh, we found the most flowery and ornate empty rhetoric that Joseph Smith put to paper, and we put it in a pamphlet so that you can be impressed with all of this new Joseph Smith material. Uh, never mind all the stuff that reveals it to be a completely inherently corrupt system from the core. I thought it was interesting. I, I, first, I was going to say, okay, well, you don't want to print out all the notes to hand them out. That would be a lot of paper. But then they stuffed in other things. They really did just cherry pick. That's, that's oh, what yeah. it comes down to. Service from the George Buchanan Journal. Uh, that's such a foundational source in Latter-day Saint history that, again, it's never been available, but that's being uh, published online. Even though it's a foundational I think source. Please? Okay. All right. Okay, you guys. Our next speaker is Matthew. That's it. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long uh, haul to get through that. I'm yeah. impressed that those fear people stayed awake. But if any talk would keep you awake, it's... I have to agree with the, with him at the end of being able to see these things that have been hidden away uh, from research, from you know eyes critical or friendly for so long, is exciting. It's it's you know I I'm not in the church anymore, but I just find it intensely fascinating, and uh, this is a really exciting time I think for anyone interested in it to see these documents come out and uh, interpret them for good or ill. Any final comments, uh, Tom? No, no. Um, I'm excited to to get this volume to to read through it. Uh, my hat is off that uh, that this is happening. It's a little late, and it's certainly impelled by a lot of uh, social forces. Uh, but uh, at least it's happening, and uh, and they're doing a pretty high quality job uh, with most of the, of the papers project. So uh, I'm my hat's off, and uh, I'm looking looking forward to it. All right. All right. You you've both been positive. I'm going to be negative. You ready? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, honestly, as a historian, I, I love that they're doing this. Uh, however, I, I hate the tone. Uh, there comes a point where an individual is no longer a, a beacon of honesty or of virtue, and it's pretty darn apparent. And no matter how much lipstick you're putting on the pig, it's it's ugly to me. Uh, I would rather that they just publish them without the rhetoric, without the footnotes, without the, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, it's a context of our time. You've got to consider all of the sources uh, and just let people read through them. And I think that that would be a lot more history. Um, I'm, I'm really disappointed by this talk. Uh, and, and, I mean, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed. There's an integrity, I think, that historians need to maintain, and it was not maintained here. He breathed over the things that needed to be talked about. He, he spun openly. He ap applied things that were not relevant to the topic and, and couched them in both sides saying, well, it wasn't really like what I'm just about to say. Um, and, and I find that really, really frustrating there is, it's like going to a science symposium where they talk about the science and then you find out that they didn't actually have a control group on any of it and it doesn't apply to people over 30 uh, or men or women or, you know, whatever. It's, don't do that, guys. Just let the documents speak for themselves and answer questions honestly. And what we saw there was not, well, I mean, there was some honest. Uh, there was some question answering. There was some, but there's a lot more that could be done here that would be of a higher quality for the history. And I would, I want them to hold themselves to that level of integrity. But I will echo 
to end on a high note, uh, I really am glad that they are putting the effort into it and that these things that have been hidden from the world in a dark corner for so, so many years are finally seeing the light of day. Uh, well, I think now is the chance for the church to show its character. And if they end up having to make illegitimate explanations and rationalizations that would excuse any charlatan at any time anyway, then it just reveals more of the nature of the church as they try to excuse and frame Joseph Smith in a way that promotes faithfulness rather than a realistic assessment of a, uh, a very colorful and troubled character in history. So I want to thank you guys for uh, going sitting through this for me. I really enjoyed the discussion, and I am looking forward to stuff coming out on both of your blogs once these... Um, uh, documents are in your hands, uh, then it's going to be a delight to see what you guys are able to pick out of it. So uh, we'll sign. Take care.